It is Monday, March 13th, 2023, and we are here today for a virtual hearing on Docket 0137, an ordinance establishing protections for the city of Boston tree canopy. We referred to the committee on January 11th, 2023. This docket was sponsored by myself, Councilor Liz Braden, and, Kendra Lara, and Councilor Kendra Lara. Uh, in accordance with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law, relieving public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement that public bodies conduct its meetings in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public. The City Council will be conducting this hearing remotely and it is being recorded. This enables the City of Council to carry out its responsibilities while ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate alternative means. The public may watch this hearing via live stream at www.boston.gov slash city council tv or on xfinity 8 rcn 82 files 964. written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.go at boston.gov it will be made a part of the record and available to all counselors uh, if you wish to provide public testimony and have not signed up to do so please email christine o'donnell at c-h-r-i-s-t-i-n-e dot o-d-o-n-n-e-l-l -L at boston.gov for those giving public testimony, please make sure that your name is visible so that I may call on you. Make sure your name is the same name that you sign up with uh, on Zoom. Uh, members of the public will be promoted to panelists when your name is called. Please make sure that you click yes when you're prompted to join as a panelist. This morning, I am joined by my council colleagues, Council President Ed Flynn, Councilor Liz Braden, Councilor Kenzie Bach, Councilor Rusi Louis-Jen, uh, Councilor Kendra Lara, and Councilor Gabriela Coletta. This ordinance was sponsored by myself, Councilor Braden, and Councilor Lara. This ordinance seeks to preserve the existing tree canopy and replenishment of the depleted tree canopy in order to prevent adverse climate effects such as heat island effects, flooding, and air pollution, as well as improving the quality of living for residents in the city of Boston. This ordinance seeks to institutionalize the position of a tree warden, a senior urban forestry and landscape planner at Urban Forestry Committee, uh, as well as establishing a process for the removal of tree replacements for public shade trees and the removal of private trees establishing criteria for the removal of city trees and establishing a street tree stabilization fund. This hearing is an opportunity to hear from the administration as well as public testimony on the matter in front of us this morning. As chair, I'm going to allow council colleagues to give brief opening remarks, beginning with my co-sponsors, Councilor Brandon and Lara, and then I'll turn it over to the administration. I also wanna note uh, that the tree ordinance uh, has had uh, several iterations of sort of versions or drafts sent to us and that uh, we understand, uh, certainly I, myself as the original sponsor, uh, the amount of sort of territory it's trying to cover. And so what is likely to uh, be part of this process is making sure that we're addressing all of the different sort of buckets of this, which include public land uh, and, and sort of strengthening public trees on public land, uh, dealing with private trees, dealing with private trees as it relates to uh, trees on, on properties or land that are sort of post for development, which is different than, say, someone's single family home tree, and then dealing with those finances uh, and funds and fines. And so those are sort of four different buckets, and we are going to work this through, and it may, uh, in final uh, form, take multiple uh, passages, multiple drafts uh, to get us there. And so I just want folks to be aware that we're, we're aware of the number of different ways in which this uh, reaches. Uh, and so I'm going to go to the original co-sponsors and then uh, in order of arrival. So I'm going to start with Councillor Liz Braden. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists who are going to be here this morning. Um, I'm going to keep my my comments very brief. I, I, um, I am so happy that we're having this conversation and that we're working on uh, developing a, a comprehensive tree ordinance for the city of Boston. Um, when you look at aerial photographs of the city and our juxtapose, or look at our neighbors as they relate to uh, the tree canopy in neighboring municipalities, it's almost shocking to see the difference uh, and how uh, other cities like Brookline and Newton and Cambridge manage to maintain their tree canopy in their cities. So um, trees are vitally important to our health. They're a very important tool in carbon capture and they're very important to keep our cities cool and our air clean in the, in the increased uh, frequency of heat waves, etc. So um, I'm really excited to have the conversation this morning and look forward to the work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Lara. 
Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to my co-sponsors for including me. Uh, I'm also going to keep my comments short because I'm really excited to get into this conversation. I think that we are past time to really have something um, like Councilor Braden set a comprehensive tree ordinance for the city. I know that there are a lot of moving pieces in terms of how this happens, how it's implemented, and so I'm really grateful for um, Chief White Hammond and the work of your cabinet and Commissioner Woods. Uh, to help us figure out how we move this forward and how we implement this in a way that works for everyone. Uh, we've been having a lot of conversations around green stormwater infrastructure. And I have said before, and I want to reiterate here, that when we're building green stormwater infrastructure, we're just trying to recreate what na what's already existed in nature, what we have removed because we've built on top of it. And so maintaining our trees, making sure that we're protecting the tree canopy is just one way that we are trying as we expand our urban city, that we're maintaining as much as we can um, and protecting um, the trees and our neighbors. So I am here for this conversation and I will see my time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Lara. Uh, Council President Ed Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to you and to the uh, sponsors for the important work on this issue. Um, I'm on, I, I support what is being proposed and what's being discussed. I think this is a critical issue. I know some of my district and District 2, especially Chinatown, has the fewest trees, um, probably of any neighborhood in the city. So I want to work closely with city officials to improve that but also to address and maybe do an inventory on any trees that have been killed uh, through um, gas leaks as well. So I'd be interested in learning about um, gas leaks impacting our trees and how we're replenishing them as well. So I also want to say thank you to um, Reverend uh, White Hammond for the important work occur and um, Commissioner Ryan Woods, their teams are doing on, on this issue. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, Councillor Bach. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And yeah, thanks also to the um, city team. I'm really excited that we're able to talk about this ordinance um, in in combination with kind of like a real ramping up of our tree capacity in the city, um, because I feel like I mean, you mentioned, Mr. Chair, there are a lot of component pieces to this. And to me, it's really important that we're looking at public land and we're looking at private land, um, and also that we're thinking about maintenance and how we keep our existing trees healthy, since that's such an important piece of the overall um, tree canopy. We obviously can't be adding if we're also losing and expect to grow to the kind of density of urban forest that the city really needs. Um, so just, I, I really want to appreciate um, both the um, the, administration members and also all the folks who have served on the task force and, and kind of just there's so many community voices that have been lifted up for trees and I suspect some of them will be on this call later but I just want to say there are a lot of the um, voices that I really value um, and and one of the things that I really value is the folks who are speaking up for trees in the city are also actively caring for trees. You know, my my district is really fortunate to see partnership with both the Friends of the Public Garden and the Emerald Necklace Conservancy on the care of our trees on public land. Um, and I think it's a, it's a really great model for how the public and private side can come together for the public land trees. And I think it's a really interesting question how the public and private side come together to support the private land trees. Um, and so excited to hear from the chief and others about um, ideas and, and models on that front. Uh, you know, the everybody says it, it's but it's true, the trees are the lungs of the city. Um, and, you know, I think that the city of Boston is growing. We're going to keep growing, keep being more people in the city. Um, and it's hugely important from an environmental perspective that we figure out how to grow in ways that are smart and ways that recognize that as those numbers of people increase, we need more trees as well. Um, and so it can't be a zero sum um, question. We really have to grow together um, as we always have. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm just really glad to be here, Mr. Chair, and thank you to you and the sponsors for bringing this before us. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Uh, Councillor Louis Jen, uh, then we'll be followed by Councillor Coletta. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to everyone uh, for being here to discuss this ordinance. It's incredibly important, as everyone has stated. 
want to thank the administration for the work that you all are already doing on making sure that we are expanding our tree canopy and protecting our tree canopy. Um, similar to Council Block, I know that there are so many people, individual private citizens, who take the onus on themselves to water our trees, to prune our trees, to care for them. Um, and that speaks volumes to sort of the, the residents that we have and the advocacy that we have among the different groups and individuals who literally are sometimes pulling wagons full of water to ensure that our trees are are properly watered. I know that when we're talking about whether it's arborists or more uh, em employees for green jobs, this I think there's gonna be part of this discussion is how do we properly staff up to meet the need. Um, and I know that there's a range of things that we want to make sure uh, that we're able to do. And I think having um, open conversations about what we're able to do, given you know staffing abilities, I think is going to be important. And, and, and for us to think creatively about how we support groups that are already doing the work and that already have expertise. So um, I look forward to this conversation. It's obviously an important, as a citywide city councilor, um, environmental justice neighborhoods and areas are of uh, prime importance when we're thinking about, uh, you know, how trees, you know, the importance of trees to dealing with uh, pollution, uh, carbon uh, dioxide release. I think uh, Councillor Councillor Flynn mentioned Chinatown being an area with with one of the neighborhoods with the fewest trees. I know East Boston is also a neighborhood that struggles with tree maintenance. So um, I'm looking forward to thinking about how we look at this also from an equity perspective and center the neighborhoods that have uh, have the lowest tree density and and also think about how we support our private citizens who want to maintain trees on their properties but have difficulty doing so. So thank you and I look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Councillor Louis Jen. Councillor Coletto who will be followed by Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to be sure to thank the makers and sponsors of the Stocket, um, pushing this out early last year and again, refiling it. I, I do look forward to getting into the weeds on this. Um, I do want to, I don't want to belabor the point, but just uplift the fact and echo Council Louis Jen that District 1's tree canopy is significantly lower than uh, than other neighborhoods. I think East Boston it is the lowest. I could be wrong on that, um, ne next to Chinatown. But we do feel the burdens already of an international airport and being a thoroughway for, for regional traffic. So I see this ordinance as a way to increase our, our tree cover and, and double our efforts to plant new healthy trees in those environmental justice communities. And so I fully support uh, the language in this, like I said, I do look forward to, to talking about the details, but we need to be able to protect, especially as we grow, just protect as many trees as we can on, on public, private, and, and institutional properties across the city. So thanks so much, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Councillor Coletta. Uh, Councillor Julia Mejia. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the sponsors. I um, also want to echo my uh, sentiments of my colleagues in support of this ordinance and how everything has been laid out. And I also just want to underscore that as we continue to have conversations like this, I think it's important for us to um, continue to uplift our, our our most vulnerable and resilient communities, who who are who tend to be the hardest hit on all things that deal with climate justice, and and so. Uh, you're muted. Let's start thinking about. Um, in terms of education and um, engagement with residents, I, I think that you know there is a, an air, what I'd like to say a privilege in terms of um, mm -hmm. access to information. There, there are some folks who don't understand the impact of of the importance of tree maintenance, and so I think that there's an opportunity for us to also educate communities who feel disconnected from the environmental justice conversation. And I think uh, through this process, we might be able to uplift uh, some education that we can share with folks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Uh, I just want to uh, do a quick just timeline for folks to understand. So this was presented uh, while the urban forestry plan was underway. Uh, we heard from a number of advocacy groups and neighborhood organizations that they felt actually engaged by the urban forestry plan, which I want to commend the city for that. And so in order to not uh, have them essentially giving their input to the urban forestry plan and then having to do it again with us. We waited for the completion of the urban forestry plan to then move forward with this project uh, and make sure that we're doing it in collaboration uh, with the city in a way which the city can implement and be effective. And so uh, there's a number of different aspects to this and what will likely end up happening, just so folks are aware of sort of the timeline of this, is that we will take the things in which we can move quickly uh, and we will get them done first. And then we will, as the year is going on, put together 
uh, plans for the harder aspects of these, the things that uh, don't yet have clear roadmaps to uh, being enforceable or clear roadmaps to uh, being uh, efficient. And so we will put together language that I think the city largely agrees with that we can actually do, that we can maintain and get all of those things, the things where there's broad agreement out the door earlier in this process and then have a second round with the more difficult aspects of this. And so I want to thank the city for their collaboration. I want to thank our neighborhoods and our organizations for their collaboration. They've been incredibly helpful. Uh, I want to go now to the administration. Uh, so uh, I'm going to begin with Reverend Mariama White Hammond, Chief of Environment, Energy and Open Space for the City of Boston. We also have Ryan Woods, Commissioner of Parks and Recreation for the City of Boston, Todd Mister, uh, Direction of Urban Far uh, the Director, sorry, of Urban Forestry for the City of Boston, uh, Lisa Meyer, who's the Chief Landscape Architect for the City of Boston, and Max Ford Diamond, who is the Tree Warden for the City of Boston. Um, for, as you all can give openings. I think you have a presentation as well. You can whatever makes the most sense, uh, Chief. I'm going to hand over this portion to you. And thank you all for the work you do, and thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, Councilor Arroyo, um, for sponsoring this, and Councilor Braden for co-sponsoring this, and for the amazing, really great turnout of so many councilors. Um, we uh, are clear about um, how much alignment there is across the city on the importance of trees, um, and, and so we are really excited to begin this process of really taking what we found in, in the conversations and the research that came out of the urban forest plan and turn it into action that really supports our canopy and moves us forward. Um, I do want to um, note, I, I'll sort of talk again at, towards the end of, the, um, of this to really talk about how we um, believe it's worth approaching this based on what we learned in the urban forest plan. You've already heard some um, notion that there are four pieces that we that we want to talk about and each of them are, are really important. Uh, but I want to go ahead and hand it over to Commissioner Woods, um, who will then pass it on um, to to Liza Meyer to keep us moving and then to Todd. So we're, we'll, we'll, we're all going to sort of connect and share um, a piece of this and then conclude with a recommendation of how we might best um, continue the work that began in the urban forest plan and make sure that we're tackling these issues in a way that actually has a lot of space for public input, but also can make a difference um, in short order as we continue to work through these challenges. So um, I'll, I'll hand it over um, to Ryan and then I'll, I'll share again towards the end. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Ryan Woods, Parks Commissioner for the City of Boston. Uh, very exciting topic for us, long in the making. We are thrilled that this past September, we were able to finalize and publish and announce our urban forest plan out in the Arbor Arnold Arboretum. And from that, one of the first early action items was to form a team. So um, you'll hear from him uh, very soon, but we're excited that Todd just joined us um, a couple weeks ago. So I think this is big be on the job for him as our director of urban forestry coming from the Detroit area, um, having a, a wealth of background dealing in municipal government uh, in Detroit, also serving in a smaller suburb as the director of public works out there um, and has a big background in community engagement, which we're very excited about and think that's one thing we continue to hear over and over throughout the urban forest plan, the need for more engagement and more involvement. And we think uh, Todd's uh, the best person us in that. In more exciting news, um, we have three arborist positions that were all offers were made in the past week. So um, there are three new arborists that will be joining us. I think the last one by the first week in April, but um, the other two starting the end of March. So um, we are acting, we are being, uh, we are reacting to the urban first plan and checking that first check marks of adding more employees. From that, you're going to see uh, more general foremen, more tree equipment operators, and a couple office staff as well. So we're really excited to get the ball uh, moving and uh, finally have some staff. Uh, so it's not all the burden on Max as it has been for a while behind that computer. So with that, I'm going to pass it off um, to Liza first so she can talk about our uh, the work that we've done on the urban forest. Great. Thank you. I want to make sure that um, people are seeing my screen. Are you seeing slides? Okay. Let me do this 
slideshow. Okay, great. Um, so as uh, you've seen, we have a group of us here today and we're grateful to be uh, here to talk about urban forestry. Again, I'm Liza Meyer, I'm Chief Landscape Architect for the Parks Department and thank you councilors for the opportunity to speak with you about urban forestry and um, tree protection work going forward. I'm gonna provide a brief overview of the urban forest plan work um, and how it's informing what we're doing in the Parks Department and more broadly. And then I'll pass it on from there. So the urban forest plan was about a year and a half long planning effort that began in February of 2021 and was completed, like Commissioner Wood said, um, this past fall. It was a team effort in every way from an expert group of consultants to city staff in multiple roles in departments and a broad community advisory board. And I'm gonna just move quickly through this because I know many people have a lot of familiarity with this plan, but in the interest of those who may not, um, I'll touch on some of the highlights. So the plan informed four goals and a set of seven strategies. The goals are the overarching ideas that we'll come back to as we make decisions and set priorities within urban forestry work going forward. And then the strategies, um, which are in the right column here, are what emerged from inventory analysis and community input, um, all of which led us to a set of next steps and recommendations, which are the body of the plan itself. There's, there are so many recommendations that I'm not going to attempt to try to run through those today, um, but hopefully people have had a chance to dig into the plan or will soon. Um, the work we're doing here with discussing a tree protection ordinance um, focuses on several of those strategies and those are the ones with the boxes around them um, on that slide. So I'll take a minute to quickly provide um, an overview of some of the findings from the plan. The, the process incorporated a number of different data sources, some about Boston's existing trees and canopy, including a comprehensive street tree inventory, which is something we haven't had before. Um, and some of the data is related to the context within which we're managing the canopy, like the city's heat resilience plan. Oops, sorry, back here. Um, Beyond uh, the data itself, we worked very closely as um, the chief and commissioner said, with a group of community stakeholders. We had we put together a community advisory board of over 60 people in three different groups. Um, there was the equity council, which was composed of community members and representatives from grassroots community-based organizations um, in historically excluded and marginalized communities. The Equity Council is the body that took the lead on establishing the goals that I shared on the previous slide um, and the recommendations, and then the larger CAB reviewed and provided input on those goals. We also worked with the Interdepartmental Working Group, which were representatives from city departments um, and agencies, all of whom have a hand in um, tree care protection and management. Um, and then we had a larger collaborating partners group, which was made up of representatives from key partner organizations, such as nonprofits and institutions, as well as um, some engaged members of the public who weren't engaged with a particular nonprofit. You may have seen some of these graphics before, um, but I think it's always good to be reminded of some of the findings. So, some of what we learned is that canopy distribution, as many of the councillors already re referenced this morning, it varies across the city um, with less canopy all in all in the inner core areas, but also quite a range of canopy coverage within a neighborhood itself. So it's not as simple as one neighborhood has high canopy and another one has low canopy. If you look at the graphic um, with the green, the darker green areas are areas of higher canopy. And you can see just within, let's say, Austin Brighton itself, there are parts of that neighborhood that are very, have low coverage and parts that have higher coverage. Um, we see the same or similar patterns in Hyde Park, similar patterns in Dorchester, even East Boston, we see areas of very little canopy and then other parts of the neighborhood that have, have more. So this is a complex picture that we need to keep in mind as we move forward. The two diagrams on the right of the screen um, show canopy change. Um, so the areas in red are the places where we saw canopy loss over the five years between 2014 and 2019. 
And what's interesting is some of those places where we're seeing the greatest canopy losses are also the same places that have higher existing canopy coverage. And then canopy gain, which on the right images are what's represented in the greener areas or the greener dots, um, are places where we're seeing more gains in places where we have lower canopy coverage. So this is an interesting thing to keep in mind. Um, I think it tells us that some of the work we're doing to grow and protect the canopy in places that have lower canopy coverage is making a difference. Um, but it also shows us that places that have currently higher canopy are at greater risk of loss because there's more canopy there to lose and we need to be, um, as we're talking about today, putting in place measures to protect those trees. Another thing that became clear um, through the urban forest plan process um, is that canopy exists on both public and private property. Um, we see more canopy on private lands in the city of Boston than we have on public lands. So about 60% on private property and about 40% on public lands. And if we look closely at this, I'm not sure that it's easy to see in a screen share, but as you look into the downtown inner core um, neighborhoods, there's more of the green, the trees growing on public lands. That's the predominant um, situation in the inner core. And then as you move out of the inner core to the neighborhoods, we see more trees on private property, with the exception obviously of these large parks and space um, areas in, um, in those neighborhoods as well. So over the course we did, um, before the urban forest plan, we did uh, a canopy change analysis with the University of Vermont um, that looked at data from 2014 to 2019. And that showed us that the overall canopy in the city had remained relatively steady at 27% um, between those years. But that doesn't mean that we didn't actually see quite a bit of change. It just sort of balanced out. So this graphic shows us where those changes took place. The green bars show acres of canopy increase and the orange bars show acres of canopy loss. So what's interesting here is that the places where we see the most canopy gains are public open space, parks, um, the right of way, so streets, and then also institutional properties. And then the places where we're seeing the greatest canopy loss are residential properties. When you combine all of those acres of gain and loss, that's where we're seeing that we're pretty much holding steady. But if we weren't seeing so many gains in rights of ways, parks, and on institutional lands, we would probably be seeing that 27% number drop um, because of the losses on, on certain other kinds of properties. So where does all of this lead to? The plan produced a series of detailed action items and recommendations, and it also generated maps for each neighborhood highlighting priority areas for planting and for tree protection. The tree protection ordinance or a series of tree protection ordinances um, is one important piece of what we need to do as a city and regulatory considerations extend to permitting processes throughout city departments, um, you know, from zoning to sidewalk permits, and these are all things that need to be thought through. And this work needs to be coupled with other operational investments. So some of the key takeaways from the urban forest plan are that protecting and caring for existing canopy is one of the most effective ways to expand the urban forest to build a healthier, more resilient city. And the trees need to be factored into all decision-making processes um, across the city in all departments. And that communication, education, and outreach are foundational. The city needs partners to help us be successful in this area, and we know that the public wants to be involved. So a lot of the work um, that the recommendations lead to are about is about operations and making sure we're able to invest um, where we need to invest and sustain those investments. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Todd Meester, who is the new director of forestry, to talk about some of the operational changes that are already underway. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, it was a great introduction from uh, Commissioner Woods. And I have been in this role now for two weeks. And in fact, I've been in the city of Boston for two weeks. Again, my background, I worked in the city of Detroit for a number of years in urban forestry, and also worked, as Commissioner Woods said, for another municipality in a public works capacity. 
So I'm excited to be in a place like Boston that really, again, has a real interest in improving their canopy and especially doing so in an equitable and sustainable way. And it's not just advocates that are out there calling for this, but that there's um, real uh, political energy behind it, that elected officials really want to be a part of this process and engage in this process. So again, the first part of this process is you know, setting that roadmap, which Liza talked about already, that uh, urban forest plan, which has been, um, the process has been gone through and it's been adopted. Now that's essentially a 20 year plan, but we have to start somewhere on this road. And so if we could go to the next slide, Liza. So the first thing is just one of the things that was called for was just reorganizing our, our urban forestry division. And one of the first things that is clearly defined in the plan is to hire a director of urban forestry to sort of help guide that vision um, that's set out in the plan and kind of implement those things. And that, that is complete. Again, as of two weeks ago, I again started in this role. And then the next part of the process, again, as Commissioner Woods described, we have three arborists that are in the process of being hired. Again, offers have been made and we're just uh, waiting for them to be onboarded. Um, but that is really going to help us, uh, again, address this backlog of constituent concerns that we have. And first and foremost, as this urban forestry division, we need to you know, address the resource, the asset that we're, we're tasked with managing. And that is especially our, our street trees, our shade trees. And so we have this 311 system and lots of calls and concerns come in on a daily basis. And currently we just don't have the capacity with you know, our, our tree warden, Max Ford Diamond just can't keep up with all of that on his own. So these arborists will really kind of help us get ahead of that and not just uh, being reactive all the time or being you know, well behind in what we need to do. So we're excited to, be, to have that piece you know, well underway. And then ultimately we wanna to move to a more flexible kind of division and how we operate. We work a lot with contractors and you know, we still wanna um, use contractors for the work that we do of pruning trees and some large removals, but we really wanna have that flexibility of, of in-house work. Currently we just have one crew that responds to emergencies, but we wanna build this out to having multiple uh, in-house field crews that can address the uh, address the needs of the urban forest, especially as we talk about these young trees. We want to plant more trees and build canopy, but we need to make sure that we maintain those trees, uh, especially from when they're very young, so that we can have these mature trees that will get us all the more benefits down the road. And then related to all of this, we want to have some admin support, and this will really help us um, make sure we're tracking our data and that we can eventually get this data available to the public in, in many forms. And then also making sure that we have good follow-up with constituents. You know, if people just put, put in a phone call and then we go out and do the work, we want to have some follow-up, make sure there's some engagement about exactly what their concern was or if there's anything, you know, larger uh, that needs to be addressed after we've, you know, completed an initial work based on a phone call. And of course, we're hoping to have somebody that can help us with some, uh, some GIS work, that's ge geographic information system so that we can map our, our trees and the concerns related to trees or just information about trees. So we're hoping to be able to, to keep that information up to date and to share that very publicly. So we can move to the next slide. So ultimately we really wanna to move to you know, proactive, a proactive urban forestry program. Again, right now we are very much reactive. Again, people call in, we go out and eventually inspect it and address it. And right now with that backlog, it could be weeks or months before we uh, can address a concern that's, that's given to us by a particular constituent. So again, we wanna have more of a regular, uh, regular maintenance on a, on a cycle. And this way we can maybe get the problems before people have to call in. And you know, this also helps us address you know, areas where people might be a little more skeptical of calling on city services or they have less less history of getting response from, uh, from city government. So if we can be pro more proactive in those neighborhoods, you know, we won't have to rely on just the, the, the squeaky wheel getting the grease and the people calling us in order to address these concerns. Uh, but ultimately all the work that we're doing really is going to focus around uh, some level of community engagement. You know, we need to understand the unique needs of, uh, of local neighborhoods, their unique needs and concerns. Again, we have lots of great maps and data like the one that's on the slide on the right, and it shows us priority zones that are looking at different indicators. You know, these are historically marginalized areas or where there might be, you know, immigrant groups or there's, there's been some history there where they might not have gotten the level of city services, especially relating to the urban forest canopy. Uh, again, that data tells us something, 
uh, but I don't want to just show up and start putting trees in the ground there because that may not be the, the first concern of the people that actually live there. And this is what you know my work in the city of Detroit especially has, has taught me through, again, through the work that we were doing and through research that was done um, by actually a woman getting her, doing her doctoral dissertation. Uh, again, the engagement with the community, people actually know a lot about trees and they like trees and they want trees, but we'd found out that people didn't want the city to go and plant a tree right in front of their house because there were other concerns. They just had a mistrust of, of city government and the fact that they were going to take care of it or that other services weren't delivered. So we really need to have a dialogue with individual communities you know, to find out what their concern is. Again, we, we have this data, we could go there and just start planting trees, but again, that's not a, 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 a recipe for success with you know, leaving out that community engagement com component. Again, we engaged with the plan and we need to keep engaging as we move forward with implementation of the plan and different particular uh, policies that we implement or, or particular projects that we implement. And again, ultimately, we want to expand our tree canopy. That is the main goal here. Again, this is about sustainability and all the benefits of, of having a, an increased urban forest canopy. And we need to have the, the community support there. That may be them you know, helping to water the trees at some point. That may be they just have some interest in the tree so they're not uh, damaging it by taping signs to it or, or stapling things to it or parking their, their car right next to it and damaging it. So again, having that, that level of dialogue is, is important for any project that we do. And again, as we ramp up our, our crew here in the, in the forestry division, we'll have more capacity to, to engage on all aspects of the work that we're doing. And if we could just move to the last slide. And ultimately, we need to have some form of communication. Again, communication is key to everything that we do. Um, so we do have this uh, street tree inventory that was conducted as kind of uh, the beginning component of the urban forest plan. We want to make sure that we keep that up to date, that there is some sort of public interaction with that. Uh, again, so people can see what's out there, see what trees are in other communities, uh, maybe know a little bit about the condition of the tree or the species of the tree. Uh, we want to make sure, again, that this information is uh, very transparent and very easily accessible. Perhaps that's a, a web, web page featured on the Parks and Recreation Department's uh, website on the city websites, um, but we need to consider all media. And that may be social media, but that may also be something as simple as printed media. Again, understanding that there are different levels of access that people have in different communities. Again, so engaging those communities and understanding what what is best to, to make sure that they have access uh, to information that we're able to provide. Again, ultimately, I put community engagement once again. That is what is you know, the, the foundation of everything that we need to do as we move forward with our, our expanded urban forestry division. So again, we're, we've got a roadmap. Um, I've got a couple weeks here and I look forward to you know, a long a long experience of engaging with the community and um, building this uh, urban forest canopy in a very equitable and sustainable way. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much uh, and welcome to Boston. Thank you for taking on this this job. I guess this is sort of your welcome to Boston here <laughs> two weeks in. Uh, yes. but Thank you for taking on this important work uh, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, Chief Hammond White, uh, White Hammond, if there's any, yes. anything else yeah. you guys want before we kick it over to questions? Yeah, so I want to close out um, first by um, noting that uh, Todd literally is the manifestation of where, you know, we put some ideas on paper and, and I've started moving them and we look forward um, somewhere in the midst of this process. Our arborists will also be joining us and people will get the opportunity to sort of see um, um, them in place. I do also want to know, um, we're not going to take a ton of time to talk about this, but um, another exciting development that also came out of the, the um, response from the urban forest plan was that urban forestry was the first track in power core which launched last year in june um and uh, as has been said max has a million things on his plate but he made time to um, take out some of the power core um young folks and um, they were able to help with doing some planting um, and learn a little bit about what the city's processes around maintenance and actually i think max it was one of your 
professors that also came and did quite a bit of the training for um, uh, the Power Core team. And so we are looking forward and hoping um, that as those tree crews are moving into the hiring phase, that members of Power Core will be applying for those jobs. And so it's just worth noting that um, we are not just thinking about sort of how we get started with folks who are already in um, the field and, and attract strong folks who are already in the field, but we are also creating a pipeline, particularly of young adults from our EJ communities who are getting training around this. And so they will be, once again, I think in the spring, able to, to participate and assist with the spring planting um, work. Another thing that's also worth noting, just so folks know, is that um, we have recently um, awarded uh, a, a grant to uh, Mass Audubon to support on planting on private land, um, which is really excited, exciting. Uh, and we'll be getting our first planting season, a pilot planting season this spring. Uh, and so just want to note to all the advocates uh, who are on this call, we hope that you'll be hearing from Mass Audubon. Their, goal, their work is to convene an alliance of uh, uh, tree planters across the city that can do work on private land with a specific focus on our environmental justice communities where we've had um, it, that are particularly under canopy. So I want to also do a big thanks to Mayor Wu and to uh, Mayor, Mayor Wu's budget last year. That's what helped to begin the expansion of, of the tree division and to many counselors who even added on to the <laughs> that uh, budget and made sure that we got it. And all of that was possible because advocates were active and vocal about the desire to see that these things um, move forward. And so I just think it is, we are often tend, tend to think about what we need to change and that's important, but sometimes we forget to celebrate the moments when things are moving. And so I just want to, um, celebrate that this, the, we, where we are this year is significantly different from where we were last year. Um, and that's because of folks working together to make that possible. So I think it's been, as it's been previewed, uh, we believe that there are four key challenges um, that we need to address to really make a difference on these issues. The first is trees on public land. There are some provisions that we have, and I know we, we looked at a lot of the um, language that came out, um, and we were excited that there is a tree ordinance. And our concern is that trying to fit all of the issues in one ordinance um, is likely to make so many different conversations moving at the same time, and, and in essence may not be as easy for people to engage because we're actually talking about so many different things. And so we believe that there are four things that all need to be worked on, um, and our suggestion is that we start uh, with trees on public land. The second is trees on private land that is already built. We're talking about homes that uh, folks are already living in, small businesses, things that are already in our environment as of right now that have some level of trees or potentially could have trees and we wanna look at how we do that. The third is trees on private land being redeveloped or developed for the first time. These are the places where you might have, for instance, large swaths of trees that are being clear cut or you might have people significantly changing the way that a piece of land is oriented. And there are specific concerns that come in that major redevelopment renovation process that we wanna talk about. And then the final is fines. We do currently have a tree mitigation fund, but we do need to have a lot of conversations about what is the amount of mitigation that one, supports the work that we're doing to grow and our canopy and protect our current canopy. And what do we do for the example, as I mentioned in, in number two, private land that's already there, the individual homeowner that has a tree, maybe the tree is, is unhealthy, maybe they don't have the resources. How do we really think about um, an amount and a fine that, that deters people while also thinking about people who may not have the resources that they need to, to care for trees? We do not want everybody to be thrown in the same bucket of fines, 
And we need to think about, um, in some cases, are there instances where we might need a home rule petition to be able to change some things? Um, these, all of these different issues are governed by different sets of city and state laws um, and past practices that all need to be looked at. We also would like to see more of our um, city team in this conversation. We are having conversations with other departments that are impacted by this or play a role in this. Um, and we want to create some opportunity for more of their engagement. And so we actually are suggesting that we start this conversation with the trees on public land, move forward with a robust community process as part of this, but also create an opportunity to invite in some of our sister agencies that also play a role in trees. Public Works, Boston Water and Sewer, um, and a number, the Disability uh, Commission, a number of different groups are actually impacted and are making decisions that have impact on our trees. Um, and we've started conversations with them. We actually think we should, go, Boston, Boston Public Schools, for instance. Um, again, there are a lot of agencies that have trees on their property, want to look at how we do that, want to look at how we're more streamlined and clear, Boston Housing Authority, et cetera. And so we think that um, breaking it up into those four buckets will actually focus the conversation. There's still a lot in each of those buckets. So I don't want to make it seem like, oh, if we just do this, it'll be fast and, and, and done. Um, each of those buckets is actually relatively large and they require different folks at the table to have those conversations. So we've actually shared um, recently some language uh, around trees on public land. Uh, we spent some time looking at best practices elsewhere. Uh, we also had, particularly Max, participated in sort of saying, where have we been running up, up against issues that we haven't been able to fix and that we need some help on right now? Uh, so I want to uh, put that forward. I think I thank the Councillor uh, Arroyo for being open to that, to that notion. Uh, we heard clearly from folks that they want to engage. And our suggestion is that trying to engage on what could end up being almost feeling like you know, 50 different issues might actually be hard for folks to track the conversation, hard to figure out what decisions we're making, hard to figure out who needs to be in the conversation. And so if we can break it down into smaller buckets, we can actually deepen the engagement, make sure that everybody has the same level of information, and then make the decisions that make um, the most sense for each different uh, piece of the candy. So um, we can share that. We've shared that back, and I hope that we'll share that with other counselors uh, but I know we will also have a working session coming up relatively soon, so we can go over the specifics of that. It takes off a, piece, a chunk of the, of the current ordinance, and then it expands it to actually add a number of other issues that we've uh, seen on the ground and, and want to make sure are addressed. So I thank, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the great turnout by um, the council, and we're really excited to dig in. This is the next big manifestation of the urban forest plan is getting all of these policies right so that um, our team have what they need and the trees have the protection that they need so that we can be expanding our, our, can our canopy, um, not just in the short term, but for the long term. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, and I will just say uh, I'm in full support of if we have to break this in chunks, where it's, so just so folks are hearing it correctly, we're not discarding any aspect of the tree ordinance. We are simply saying there are aspects of this that we can operationalize much sooner than other aspects of it. And rather than hold them all up, we'd like to get them out quick and fast so that we can address those problems fast. And so what we will do is uh, likely bifurcate this so that we are dealing with issues uh, that we can take care of sort of immediately where there's broad consensus and operationally we are prepared to do them right away. And then we will continue to work on and get ready for later in this year, getting out the second portion of this uh, that requires some some on ramping and some uh, some real work. Uh, as has also been noted, there will be a working session in April uh, on this where that language that has been sent over by the administration and language that has come from advocates and all of and, and any of my council colleagues who might have language, all of those things will get put on the table at that time. Uh, and we'll try to figure out sort of which, what stuff is ready now, what stuff is gonna need a little bit more time. Um, and then we will go through all of that. There will be several sort of working sessions on, on this, but the first one will be in April. Um, with that, I wanna go to questions. 
Uh, and so I'm going to start with my lead sponsors and then we'll do it in order of arrival, uh, which means Councillor Braden, Councillor Lara, and then Council President Flynn will be the first three off the bat. Uh, and so Councillor Braden, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the presentation and welcome Todd, welcome to Boston. <laughs> we're glad you're here uh, as the director of Urban Forestry. We're very excited uh, and we're very excited to be ramping up the team and uh, have folks uh, onboarding as we speak. So this is wonderful. Um, one question I had was, you know, the importance of the GIS system to be uh, really, um, I feel it's really vitally important to have uh, an understanding of what's happening at, at the ground level, at the grand, really granular level. I'm just wondering, do you do that in-house or do you work in partnership with, uh, with the DOIT team? I understand the GIS team at DOIT is sort of um, uh, short-staffed at the moment, so I'm just wondering how that's working. Well, I think that's a great question. Um, right now, the plan would be if we can uh, collaborate with DOIT, that would be the you know most immediate way to address it, but you know, to add a staff person that has GIS uh, uh, experience and GIS knowledge would be ideal for us to be able to have, again, that more direct connection to updating it and making sure that our needs aren't put, you know, in the queue behind everyone else's. So, uh, again, in the immediate term, I'm going to try to work with uh, do it in any way possible. Uh, but I think uh, um, we would prefer to have an in-house person specifically within our division to to address our concerns. Yeah, you know, for me personally, I think, um, you know, there's so many departments, if we had a, a really robust G GIS uh, department that could support all of us across all the different, all the different uh, departments in the city, I think is, is something I'd like to see, but we'll ask a conversation for another day. Um, well, Councilor other... Bright, oh, just to, to give you a quick update, um, as, as Todd has said, we are both sort of looking at what we already have. There is a system that we had already put some data in that we want to reactivate. But I do, we've also been having some conversation with uh, the streets cabinet because they're looking at a new system. And the question is, would it make sense for our system potentially to be integrated with their system with trees would be looked at as a um, city asset? It's a little strange of a title, but the point is that other other things like pipes, et cetera, would be able to go in that system. And the, so anyway, so we, we are opening that conversation um, to see if we could have one system that holds everything. And then that would make it easier for you, for the public um, to, to sort of tap into those resources. But that conversation is, is probably six months to appear from being settled. So. You know, I think the do the the GIS system is an incredible tool. Like it is really, really, really powerful, and it would cover everything. Um, I just feel that you know, in terms of, we don't need to be reinventing the wheel and and take it, getting a license for another system that's duplicative or not not connected that doesn't actually talk to the GIS system. So, you know, I think that's a conversation that we need to um, explore. At, you know, in a bigger sort of admin city admin level across different departments to see if we can get something that get put some juice in the tank for the GIS uh, system so that we can we can uh, utilize the incredible power of the tool across across different departments I think that's what we'd, we'd love to see the other um, the other question I had was really you know we have trees in public land trees in private land Trees on private land is going to be developed, and then development of under under underdeveloped or de, undeveloped spaces that are seeing development, that's seeing the removal of of trees. One question I had is, are we how are we engaging with our institutions like uh, our universities who have, um, and even just thinking about uh, where does is where do they fit in? Like the arboretum is a really particular um, exception to because uh, they're they're leaders in the field of taking care of trees but you know i'm also thinking about um uh, institutional owned land uh, in our neighborhood and in other parts of the neighbor other parts of the city that how do they what bucket do they fall into so two things that i think are worth noting where we're making some strides so one um this tree alliance that we talked about one of the reasons that um we feel like it's best done by a nonprofit is its ability to engage some of those folks um, 
outside of sort of this traditional sort of city structure. Um, so we do hope that universities would be eligible to contract with or participate with um, the Tree Alliance, and we actually hope that they will do so in a way that also supports uh, the uh, financial needs of the nonprofits uh, by, by not just um, offering space for trees to be planted, for instance, but also really uh, financially supporting the alliance. The other layer to that is I met last week um, on Thursday, the Green Ribbon Commission has a, uh, there's two groups that the Green Ribbon Commission is, or three groups that they're engaging to that we specifically hope will be more active in the conversation on trees. The Green Ribbon Commission is a, um, for those who may not know, is a, a partnership between the city of Boston and um, mm -hmm. the philanthropic community to particularly the Bar Foundation to help bring together the uh, multiple large institutions in the city and help get them on board with and in alignment with our climate work. Um, and so we met on Thursday with the um, healthcare institutions and the, the colleges and universities to particularly talk about what they can be doing to support the city's climate work. And at that meeting, one of the key things I brought up was trees, particularly those who sit in environmental justice neighborhoods, because we think there's a real opportunity uh, for them to be thinking um, holistically, uh, particularly Northeastern was one of uh, the spaces that was there. Harvard was also there. So really, how do we engage them to be um, sort of just more active, even paying attention to the conversation. As Because while we are suggesting a need to focus on, on um, public trees to get started, I will note that often they are the ones, at least sometimes they are the ones leading these big development projects. So um, getting them to be more in alignment with our goals around the tree canopy could have multiple uh, benefits. Very good. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, how am I doing for time? <laughs> uh, so I, I think you're probably at the five minutes, but I want to make sure that the original sponsors have time for their questions. We will do a second round if necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Lara, the floor is yours, and then it'll be uh, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the administration um, for your presentation. So I have a few questions. When, and I might have to go for a second round. When there are trees removed, when trees are removed at a property owner, at the request of a property owner and a residential, what is the most common reason for removal? Like what is the most common common reason that you get from private property owners for tree removal? I can, I can try to get it. So there's no process right now where somebody has to go through the city to remove a private tree. So it's all anecdotal, but a lot of the times it's, you know, people are, you know, doing an addition to their home or, you know, we had an example in East Boston where a new development was putting like bay windows and a bay window is going to, you know, on the side effect or the tree on property. So it, it's all usually for development reasons, but there's, it's all anecdotal because there's no process currently where a homeowner would need to notify the city if they're removing a tree on property. Okay, so we're so it's only the councilors get a hundred emails about removing trees. Um, we might want to pull there, those. There are also instances where uh, tree roots are an, a challenge. I know my parents. Yeah, actually, tree roots on the sidewalks that are like lifting sidewalks up, messing with people's property, and so on and so forth. We get we get emails, but I guess you're right; it's all anecdotal, so we don't actually know. Right. Where most of it is. So in, in our in our plan, we've what we know is that we've lost the most tree canopy uh, in residential land than in any other kind of land use. And this ordinance, uh, we're trying to correct for that by requiring a permit for removal of what we're defining as significant trees. Um, as it's written here, and I know that you know we're there's a plan to kind of bifurcate this and separate these two. Uh, but can you share a little bit about? your plan for implementation, any considerations that you're taking, possible challenges um, outside of the four areas that you've already outlined that, you know, might require that we split this up. So I think part of the reason we're recommending to split it up is because there's actually a lot of issues that fall under each of those. So um, for instance, currently, uh, people don't have to apply for a permit, right, to remove a tree. 
So changing that is actually a pretty big change. And then the question is who would regulate that process? So we've had like, as an example, some beginning conversations with ISD. What would be um, the practicalities of that? How would that work? How do we look at what other places have done? Uh, because right now, the Parks Department, for instance, doesn't have a, a lot of uh, interaction with direct individual homeowners, right? That's not been our purview. Um, even what we are suggesting in this first chunk is that in the past, other city agencies haven't even had to necessarily tell us if they're taking down trees. So that's actually an expansion of powers for the Parks Department already. Mm -hmm. We are suggesting that if BHA, if Public Works, if Water and Sewer, if BPS is going to do work on trees and take them down, in the past they have not had to tell anybody. So we don't have, to be honest with you, good data on what's happening on private or public land mm -hmm. uh, because so many different entities exist. What we are asking at this point is that we expand to the point where everything that's on public land, that's city owned, actually we keep that data together by if somebody is going to do a tree removal, say for health, that they at least let us know so we have a, a, a sense of where are we growing, where are we, um, where are we declining. Um, so at this point, the truth is that tree work has sat predominantly in the private sector and we don't even have the good data on that, but we do have the instances. We do get some of those emails too, Councillor. Uh, so we, we know what people are concerned about. We just often don't have the jurisdiction um, or the, the people to be able to go out and, and to address that. So that's why we're also saying, let's take it in, in stages because it's kind of a very wide set of challenges and issues that we're dealing with. Great. So we, in this proposed ordinance, it would create a tree stabilization fund for planting replacement public shade trees in the city. And you mentioned earlier that we have a tree mitigation fund as well. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the similarities and the differences between the fund that's being proposed in this ordinance, the fund that currently exists, and what the funding mechanism is for the tree mitigation fund that we currently have? Ryan, did you want to take this? So currently, um, there is a fund in uh, our nonprofit, which is the fund for, for parks. And the good thing with being in the fund is the money is going right back into tree plantings and tree work, whereas mm -hmm. a lot of the funds with the city, if people are paying into these funds, it goes back into the general fund. It doesn't actually go to the department. So by having it in our nonprofit, it is going directly back in a line item that is earmarked specific, specifically for tree work. Mm -hmm. um, currently, and, and Max can probably go into more detail into this, when somebody proposes uh, removal of a healthy street tree uh, after a tree hearing was held under Mass General Law Chapter yeah. 87, which it could be for somebody, you know, putting in a curb cut or um, another type issue that they have in front of their home, mm -hmm. um, there is a measurement where they have to pay $550 per every caliper inch at chest height. Um, and that money comes in to us and that goes directly into the fund. And that mitigation is used on other plantings or planting related projects that we have going on. Okay, so it's a similar, similar funding mechanism from, from fees or fines um, and it is maintained in the nonprofit and the fund ultimately so that you can earmark it for replanting trees specifically. Correct. Do you see any any other opportunities outside of the requirements in this ordinance and outside of the, the funding stream that you currently use for the tree mitigation fund? Um, like any other opportunities for a different stream of income, like other types of actions that would produce fees or fines that could come into the tree mitigation fund? Actually, we think that there should that's a conversation that should be had at each level. So the uh, we are unlikely to put signs against other um, municipal agencies, although it's not without presidents. We do, we do get fined by public works, for instance, if we don't shovel fast enough. Um, so it, it's possible. Um, yeah. But um, I think we the question is, what is the fine for the um, homeowner? What would be the way that people don't have to pay those fines? What is the fine for the large developer? Um, on private land, we believe that on each of those pieces, the question is, if there's harm done to the canopy, what 
should be done to replace that harm. Um, and I think the question is, how do we do that in a way um, that is fair and equitable and takes into account the different resources that people have? But but we we do think that there needs to be that that is a question that should be thought through at each of these different levels. Okay, so that that is actually a good segue. I'm going to skip the question that I was going to ask next because I have a section on tree maintenance and this idea of us supporting people, um, waiving fees or fines for people who might not be able to afford maintaining or needing to remove the tree. There's some of that already in the ordinance in terms of like waiving fees, um, the warden be, being able to kind of make decisions about tree removal and so on and so forth. But I, you know, I do agree that it could be more robust and clearer specifically at these four levels that, that you're referencing. Do we have any resources right now in the city to help residents maintain trees that are currently there? No. No. So is there an opportunity to kind of, instead of uh, only using the tree mitigation fund for planting and replacing trees, also using this tree mitigation fund to support these communities, working class communities um, and homeowners who might not have the resource to really maintain the trees on their property? That is something that the Alliance could take on. Mm -hmm. um, we've looked at it. It would be a very legal issue about how you would figure it out. Because honestly, if people have the resources to pay for the tree, like work on their, in their home, they should do so. There are people that we believe really don't have it. Mm -hmm. The challenge is how would you make the decision about whose work you do and whose work you don't do? And so we actually sat down with legal, which is why we created the Tree Alliance, because they would have the power as nonprofits within their 501c3 mission to really look at issues of where are their communities, where due to their census tracts, whatever, there's a lot of different ways that they have freedom to look at it that we would not have the freedom to do as a city service. We either have to offer it to everybody, got it, no matter what, or mm -hmm. we would have to have some way of substantiating that a person was in need. And I don't think we should be in the practice of making people like give us their pace. Yeah, it would have to be like an income be, based to kind, right. know, kind of means testing the resource. So um, I think so that's part of the reason that we created the alliance is that it creates an opportunity for that resource to be developed, but in folks who do not have the same constraints that we do as a municipality. Okay. And my last question, thank you, Chair, for <laughs> um, allowing me to get through these. So a, a big, most people don't know that a big, like a big percentage of the trees that we plant don't make it. Is it something like 40% of them? Is that number correct? Do Very close, just, just under 40, yes. Under 40%. And so this ordinance no. is calling- Wait, Max, did you want to share something? That's not true. Okay. We do not know. The highest percentage of trees that have ever failed is 18% of our new trees. 18%. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, so the we, percentage of trees. Where do we get that number? <laughs> so the percentage of trees that we plant, the highest number of trees that have ever failed in a given year are yes. 18%. 18%. Thank you. So that because yes. I've seen that other number below. Yeah. So in the in the urban forest plan, the statistic is from zero to seven years. Got it. For seven years, we lose 38%. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So in the ordinance, we're hoping to send out a notice to people who are, you know, 150 feet as it's laid out, um, a notice of tree removal. Um, is there a way that we could also create, and, and I say this because I know that other counselors, you know, and other counselors said it in their opening remarks that they really have people in their neighborhoods and in their districts who are really passionate about making sure that our trees survive and about taking care of the trees in their neighborhood, making sure that they're getting sufficient water and so on and so forth. And so I think that there's an opportunity here to also create a system for noticing when we're planting a new tree to give neighbors an opportunity to either sponsor or help care and increase the chances of the tree maturing or making it, you know, beyond the zero to seven year mark. Is that, I, I know that that's like, you know, a level of like community engagement, civic engagement. And so maybe Director Santana also, we might work with, with the Office of Civic Engagement there, but I just wanted to offer that and see if there's any reactions um, positively or negatively to that. That's, a, that's another example of exactly why we thought the alliance, creating the alliance was important okay. because it would create a, it would create a one-stop place for us to be in communication and try to create some of that programming. If we're trying to do it with each different group separately, 
that would be hard to maintain. But if yeah. those groups are together in the same place and we can come up with some shared standards and things like that, we actually believe that our, our community nonprofits, our neighborhood associations are gonna do a much better job of recruiting people than we are, but we need to make sure that people, we say to people, we can say to people, this is what it means for you to take care of, of a tree. This is what we kind of need you to do. Here's what we know about when they're dying, et cetera. Because the first two years of a tree's life, we actually pay for a watering contract. Right, yeah. so we we know we're paying somebody, they have to go out and water them. The problem is what happens at the two year mark, and actually previous to that, we only were doing one year. So what, what happens at that two year mark and how do we get folks to really help us in that two to seven year range to continue to do some of that work? Yeah, because I, I think people I think people would do it. You know, we, we, we send out paper notices when there's a development or a community meeting happening. And I think that if people knew that there was a new tree on their block or a few new trees on their block that needed to be watered, or if we're getting to the end of the two year mark and we know, hey, now we need you all to kind of support uh, at, at the end, at the for the next few years or however long that people would um, welcome that kind yep. of yeah. that kind of self care. So, uh, OK, thank you, Chair. No further questions. Thank you. And some of those things, I'll try to keep some of those things in mind because I'm going to piggyback off of that later. But I want to go to Council President Flynn uh, now. So, Council President Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I wanted to focus my question or comments similar to Council Lara. Um, one of the, comp not complaints, but one of the issues I get frequently is trees that have been beautiful trees that are now kind of uprooting the 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 sidewalk um, in that are almost go in the roots are almost going into people's um, basements um, impacting impacting structures of the of the house in, in a way but certainly impacting the the sidewalk almost lifting the sidewalk up having having an impact obviously on ADA um, issues. Um, so I just wanted to ask, generally speaking, about what what the process would be if someone wanted to remove that process, remove that tree, or at least communicate with with your team to get it get an opinion on what what the best thing might 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 be able to do. Sure, I, I'll, I'll start. And just so everyone's aware, I think Max and Todd will be joining us. The power just went out of their building at 440 Park Drive, so they're trying to get back on um, through a Zoom, I believe, from their phones. Um, the the process right now is, if somebody wants to have a healthy tree removed, they have to go through a tree hearing, which is the first Thursday of every month under Mass General Law. In that, they can give any kind of evidence that shows that tree is getting into their sewerage or roots are getting in to help make a case that there's damage being done for a tree removal. Um, in terms of the sidewalk upheaving, um, that doesn't cause just for a removal of a tree. It was more than we'd work with our partners at Public Works that would do make safe and patches and stuff to try to um, smooth out the area or tar out the area um, until you know, it, you know, new sidewalks and things could be poured. But there is a process where uh, residents can come if it is deemed a healthy tree during the tree hearing process to show any evidence they have of, of what's causing problems either to their property or outside their property. Thank, thank you, Ryan. And Ryan, just as a follow up on that, can you explain to me, and that, because I get this question frequently from residents, what is the public process for removing a tree in, in, in terms of notification of residents that a particular tree will be cut down, you know, next Friday. Um, and is there, you know, just, just the notification process, how do we notify residents? And is there an opportunity for residents to at least weigh in and support or not support just, just in the, just in the interest of transparency? Yes. Uh, so Mass General Law Chapter 87 requires that was two notification so right now um, our tree hearings are always the first Thursday of every month they're posted through the city through the clerk's office they're also a legal ad is taken out by the proponent that is trying to remove the tree 
So it's in the local newspaper and we require a posting to go on for two weeks, at least on the tree in question. So um, a almost like a press release form of eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that states when the that this tree is in question and we look for the public's input during a tree hearing that would happen on that first Thursday of the month. That way, more people in the community than just the immediate abutters, anybody that walks by and is, you know, uses that as their, their route to and from or commute um, can see that too and can engage in the process. We do take um, all kinds of feedback and that is a community process to, for the tree warden to hear support or objection from um, abutters and residents about the removal of that tree. So, so there would be a notice in the in the public newspaper or the local newspaper, I should say. Um, I, I know many newspapers don't print as much as they used to since the pandemic. Um, and a lot of it is on on the internet now on social media, the, the actual newspaper. Um, and there might be some challenges of, of residents not not accessing the newspaper. But I, I, I always wanted to fix the, the part of posting a, a notice on the tree itself. Is that is that the best way for us to communicate or are we able to have something more robust than that in terms of, you know, doing a literature drop, you know, for two or three streets in and around the tree, something, something a little bit more personal towards the residents in the impacted area. Yeah, I, I think the reason why it's posted on the tree is then because it's at the cost of the city that posts the notification on the tree instead of on the resident. Not all residents had the resources to do the literature drop, almost like you have to do with ISD and stuff. Somebody's doing a, a renovation process where it, it gets, you know, whether it's certified mail or regular mail that goes out, then not everyone had the resources to do that. So by us posting it or the tree warden going out and inspecting and posting it on that tree. It is a public notice on that tree. So everybody that is there for, and it's for a two week period leading up to the hearing. Okay, uh, thank you, Commissioner. My final question, uh, maybe to uh, Reverend White Hammond. Um, thank you, Reverend. Um, and I know we've talked about this on and off for several years. Can you highlight to me what the short term plans are and the long term plans are for um, planting trees in Chinatown and how we're going to sustain them, what environmental challenges might impact um, new trees, and what can we do to provide more trees to this neighborhood that desperately needs them? Yes. So I think Chinatown is one of our, it is by far the most impacted neighborhood. Um, and, and it's challenged as you obviously know, because so much of the development is already there. Um, there's, there's a lot of concrete, um, which does not help with uh, water. It does not help with heat. It's just a real challenge. So there's a couple of things that I think we can say. Part of the reason that we are beginning this conversation on private land I mean, on pub public land is because that's one of the places, particularly in the example of Chinatown, where we might have an opportunity to make clear impact. Okay, how can we have a conversation with BPS about the redevelopment of um, the Josiah Quincy and making sure that there's a robust amount of trees in that project? As also, uh, I know you've ar already noted that we um, recently were granted a planning grant for reconnecting communities, um, particularly to look at the land above um, Route 90 to really think about whether or not there's a possibility to include a park over that by closing off some of that land um, and being able to uh, reconnect Chinatown with a, a park space. And we're looking at a variety of other spaces. So in Chinatown, we are, are most focused on one, how do we maximize the public land that we already could be working with our partners around. We are looking at land acquisition um, and because there's just a need for more parks there um, and more open space there. And we would certainly want to look at uh, private land development. I, I'm not sure, unfortunately, that there's a ton of opportunities in Chinatown around that because so much of the land has already been developed and unfortunately kind of sometimes right up to the curb. Another thing that we should be talking about, it's not part of this conversation per se, but it's something that I want to just note because it's worth 
thinking about. Um, when I went to this past summer, I went to visit Montreal. Um, that is really where we got the idea for the Tree Alliance. That's the that's a a piece of infrastructure that they use there um, and and a, just a really creative way um, to make sure that um, folks have the resources, the advocates have the resources that they need to be able to uh, get their hands dirty and put some trees in the ground and really protect them and engage residents around that piece. Uh, one of the things that they've done, and again, I know this is a sensitive topic for, for Boston, so, but I'm just gonna name it because it is a best practice that is starting to happen around the country. Um, one of the big challenges in, in Chinatown is that the sidewalks are so um, thin in most places that the ability to put a tree there, um, you, a, a person just using their two legs would have a hard time getting around, and it certainly would not be passable for a wheelchair or someone um, that's pushing a baby carriage, or even people, quite frankly, you know, moving dollies around to load them in and out of restaurants, and so. One of the things that people are doing is looking at planting trees directly into the street. It does cut down on the amount of parking, but it also can open up whole new areas of land for tree canopy. And when I look at some of the places that this has been most done, it is often places that have similar attributes to Chinatown in the sense that there's just not enough space on the sidewalk. So I'm not proposing this right now. I'm not saying that we're gonna get started right away. Uh, but, Councilor Friend, you are raising the part of the city that has the most challenging um, dynamics in terms of there being very, very little available land on which to plant trees. And this changes that dynamic. Of course, it would take people doing a lot more using of public transportation. I know that business owners would be very concerned about the loss of parking, so I'm not saying we can do that overnight. We, it would take a lot of engagement. But that is a best practice solution for communities where um, there's not a lot of additional space on the sidewalk um, to be able to plant trees. Thank you, uh, Reverend Whiteham, and thank you to Commissioner Woods and the other um, the others from the city administration. I see Liza and um, there was someone else that was here. Max and Todd were both on, and power went out at their office. So hopefully okay. they'll be back. Okay, yeah, I didn't recognize I didn't recognize them, but um, I wanted to welcome them, welcome them to the city. I think they're new employees, so I wanted to welcome them to um, the city of Boston. They're working with a great team. But having said that, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> Councillor Louis Jen, followed by Councillor Coletta, and I want to note we've been joined by Councillor Tanya Fernandez Anderson. Uh, Councillor Louis Jen. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Admin, again, for answering um, our questions and for being here and for your steadfast work. Um, I have a question regarding something Liza mentioned, which I thought was really, really important, and it was about data disaggregation when we're talking about environmental justice neighborhoods, uh, but to, to really zone in and, and think about what that means for uh, the tree canopy uh, within certain neighborhoods that might not be deemed an environmental justice neighborhood, but in certain areas, they, they, there aren't as many trees. Like you mentioned High Park being one of the neighborhoods where I live. You know, there are other neighborhoods where maybe they're not considered an environmental justice neighborhood, but there are areas within that neighborhood that don't have a significant tree canopy. So I'm wondering how we're thinking about those areas and, and what is going to be our approach our sub approach in, in those neighborhoods where perhaps it's not an EJ, where it's not an EJ neighborhood, but there are still concerns around uh, a lack of a tree canopy, um, racial equity concerns. So I just wanted to hear how we're thinking about that. Liza, did you want to jump in? Go ahead. Happy to. Um, I think it, one of the slides that Todd showed showed our um, priority zones. Um, it was, it had sort of a, a series of colors from pink to red, highlighting different areas where um, indicators of canopy need um, were layered on top of each other to highlight where our investments might be most uh, meaningful. But on that same map, you could also see that almost the entirety of the city has at least one, if not two of those indicators. It's, um, you know, the need for canopy gain and the canopy and canopy protection exists citywide. So I think I think you hit on the point. I mean, there we need to be doing this work everywhere. 
it's not about, you know, pitting one neighborhood against another, or pitting one type of planting zone against another. We need to be moving forward with all of this work across the entire city um, because places that have more canopy today are at risk of losing that canopy. Um, and, and places that are under canopied today are places where we really can, it can invest and, and see some real measures of improvement, which will you know, be meaningful. So I think we can't just take the, the data that, that we have and, and not try to pick it apart and really ask those, those important questions. Um, and some of what we need to do is also what Todd was talking about, and that is um, directly work with people, engage with communities and make sure we're hearing what people want and not just responding to, you know, data layers to, to inform our work processes. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. I don't, and Reverend Whiteman, I don't know if you wanted, if you wanted to add or, because I know we've talked about this as well and sort of how we're thinking about those sub, 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 sub areas of neighborhoods. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, as Liza showed really well, you know, one, to say a whole community is off that is not realistic. If you look at, there could be sub sub parts of a community that are really well provided for and some that are not at all. So we are paying attention to that. I will say though, we are starting our priorities in alignment with where we also see the direct impact of heat. And so that is, I do want to note that, um, that we are doing this in conjunction with the heat plan to really say, um, which neighborhoods are we finding a really serious impact on people's health and safety because of the canopy? And so we will be everywhere, and this is not about just what we're doing in the next year or two. We really have to think about this across a um, number of years, uh, but, we, but we are paying attention to that. The other thing that we'll need to be thinking about is that there are a number of actors in this. As an example, Councilor Coletta raised the issue of Massport. I, I think we need to open a conversation with them. They are a significant landowner in East Boston. And if we want to see a serious impact in East Boston, it, it would be hard to figure out how we would do that without their engagement. Um, and so I think uh, I think the, the key piece is we all want our tree canopy to grow yesterday, 100% to where it needs to be. Um, and I think we are clear um, that we want to move with urgency, but also with intentionality. Um, and that means we will start in some places, but the goal is to get to every place over time to keep being driven by, um, you know, where there continues to be need. And there's a lot of need across the city, but we are going to start and focus our resources both first where the need is sort of most urgent and where we see significant heat differentials that mean people are more likely to be having asthma attacks in some neighborhoods. If we can, for instance, like Chinatown, if we can increase the canopy there, the, the benefits for people from a health and safety perspective would be pretty significant pretty quickly. It also will be one of the hardest places to make an impact. So we're really trying to figure out, um, but I think the key thing is that people should recognize we're in this for the long haul. And so it's not, um, it's not about, uh, the idea that like if you don't if you're not the number one most supported neighborhood this year you're not going to be seen we we need to get everywhere but I, I i you know i can't emphasize enough there's a there is a differential between who are most prevalent and active in our spaces and the communities sometimes that need the most support so we're not going to just respond because you turn the most people out we're going to respond because the data tells us that people need it and that it is life-saving in some of our neighborhoods, that's where we'll, we'll be starting. Thank you, Liza. And thank you, Chief Reverend uh, Whitehaman. I think that's tremendously helpful in sort of making sure that we're centering the conversation um, around EJ neighborhoods and around uh, the neighborhoods that are experiencing that heat differential. I think sometimes that, that can get lost in the South and I think centering that is important. I, I know that there are advocates in Chinatown, I was on a call last week where they were really uplifting the need for us to be engaging in acquisition of space so that they can have more green space for this very reason. So I wanna to continue to uplift that. I think President Flynn did as well. 
Um, the second question is, is getting at, you know, the ways in which uh, private citizens are caring for a lot of our public trees. Again, mentioned there are folks who are uh, pu uh, pulling wagons to, to water our trees. My mom and I adopted a tree in our neighborhood and struggled really last year with uh, maintaining um, uh, the watering and the maintenance for that tree when we experienced um, drought-like conditions. And so I wonder, you know, someone threw this out there, a community partner threw this out there last week to me, if there, if we've explored partnerships potentially with the fire department at all about, uh, you know, watering trees and what, what that what would that could look like with our fire stations. I think that could be a, a, a creative solution, a part, part of the solution, not, not obviously not the entire solution, but part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know that Speak for the Trees has been able to develop a partnership with the fire department. And I actually asked them about that. I think that they have a, a level of openness, but what they were very clear to me is we, we can't have a hundred different keys going around the city. So I think the, the, the um, question of like what scale is appropriate, um, because what they were, what their concern was if it's a small amount, we can, we can account for it. Were everybody using, for instance, hydrants to water trees? One, the chance that people would um, open them improperly, leave them open too long, but also the fear that if we were doing that everywhere, would we affect the water pressure that they need to maintain in the case of a fire? So I think there's some openness, um, but within moderation. Awesome. Well, um, I appreciate that these conversations are happening and that there's openness. Obviously, I don't think it is the solution, but in terms of if we're trying to, you know, make this, we're in this for the long haul, try to bring all hands on deck, I think it could be a good way. I know that they, you know, that they, they do do it in specific instances, for example, that I know most clearly here in High Park, but, um, you know, trying to build them into a, a, a solution, even if it's, if, even, if, even if it's like a low level, participation but it's consistent throughout all of our neighborhoods i think that could that could be part of the solution so glad that those conversations are happening and, and can maybe be folded in here thank you mr chair those are my questions thank you very much uh councillor coletta thank you chair arroyo and i do think that we have todd back on the line so i just wanted to say welcome again just echo the calls from my my colleagues i do look forward to working with you and uh the the other arborists that are on the docket to be hired. It's it's just so welcomed. Um, and I want to be sure to thank my colleagues for their advocacy last year in the budget cycle, as well as the administration's commitment uh, for resources to fund these positions and just uplifting the chief's call out to celebrate this moment. This is one of those things where like I feel there there has been progress, both in terms of resources and collaboration. So I just want to thank everybody on this call for their efforts. Um, I also just want to thank the chief for calling out Massport as well. That was something that I was going to bring up. I've been shouting from the mountaintops that their pilot agreement is up for negotiations. And so if we are going to be a Green New Deal city and be able to hold our largest carbon emitter accountable for offsets, we should also be a role model. So just want to put a pin in that conversation and, and call that out as well. Um, based on the presentation, there were a lot of things that I love seeing, the priority zones of those in environmental justice census blocks, low canopy coverage, and um, something was also mentioned about historically marginalized areas. And I did see the areas in East Boston, Charleston, and the North End that I have anecdotally seen as being in need of, of a tree canopy or um, expanding our tree canopy rather. So I just wanna thank you all for your work in, in that respect and um, breaking this down into the buckets. It's helpful for me to operationalize this in, in my mind and help me explain it to folks in my district who are doing incredible work on the ground. Like Tree Eastie, I think we have Bill Masterson on the line. He's the master of all things trees is, is what I say. So happy for, um, or proud that he's on the call and proud of his work. But I think for my, so I have two questions and it first relates to that, that first bucket, which was street trees. And so I have heard from some of these volunteer organizations that there is a real need to expedite the process of approvals um, for permits through the city that have included and, and should include, of course, public works, disabilities. I think that you had mentioned Boston Water and Sewer Chief. It was mentioned that they should be a part of this conversation, which I support maybe for, for the working session through the chair to, to the co-sponsors, but has there been, or is there any appetite or have there been any conversations to maybe create a, a one-stop shop application 
or a city working group to help expedite tree plantings done by these incredible volunteers and, and nonprofit organizations. So if you can just elaborate on that, I, I would appreciate it. Yeah, so I think in terms of street trees, we are not actually suggesting that they be that they that be done by nonprofits um, because street trees ends up issue having issues in terms of water infrastructure, uh, utility infrastructure, all of those things that um, w it just wouldn't make sense to have a nonprofit jackhammering a new tree pit and those pieces of things. So we we do believe that it can go better and faster and that we can do better, we can improve communication. But for street trees, those will need to remain with the parks department. Um, and what we are trying to do is potentially expand what, what our language is, is to expand that we're not just paying attention to street trees, but we're paying attention to all trees that are in the public domain. Uh, but it, you know, BPS would not want a nonprofit group coming in just sort of like planting trees up that. We need to have some internal processes for that. Um, but the fact that we're going to have three new arborists is going to make a huge difference because right now Max has to go out and, and inspect all of these pieces. And, and sometimes the drag is we just didn't have enough staff to keep up with people's demand. And we are going to have some, we'll just going to be in such a better place in terms of our ability to move those requests quickly. Uh, what we do want people's help on is planting on in people's backyards to really be looking at planting even on some of our colleges and universities, which are private land, but could potentially have more robust canopy that was serving our communities. Also, lots of local nonprofits will own spaces that they could be thinking about um, planting trees there. So there, where we, where we need the help is really on the um, ways that people on private land are choosing to keep trees and they're not trees and, you know, and need help with maintenance. We can, fit, we're trying to figure out all those pieces, but the street trees would remain with us and the expansion of our, of our staff will allow us to address those, those needs so much faster than we've been able to in the past. That's great to hear. And I think just to clarify for me, so I'm thinking about specifically Tree Eastie who uh, makes these requests, right? And the, the ownership is never transferred to the nonprofit. It, it stays within the parks department, but it's it's their work and it's them pushing to, to make sure that we have an expansion of our park public trees is what has expanded a lot of the tree canopy in, in Eagle Hill, say, for example, in, in my neighborhood. And so their their concerns have been, um, and I'm not going to speak for just them, it's, it's been other folks, but just trying to get a, a tree street planted has been onerous through the permitting process in addition to the staffing capacity needs. And so that's where the, the line of my, of my question yeah, and, came from. And I think the main problem there has been if one person has to go out and verify all of those things instead of four people having the opportunity to do that, it just means it's only going to move at the pace what we can do. We also have had some places where um, as an example, I'll use the tree in front of my house. Um, it was starting to have some health issues. I called, but then they were gonna take it down. I was like, I don't want you to take it down. But in the end, what I found out was that, and it's true, I was getting tree roots in my front yard and it was pushing up um, our sidewalk in such a way that uh, people with any level of mobility challenges and, so, and you couldn't get by. So a new tree pit had to be dug. And that the, the creation of the, the moving of that new tree pit really is a conversation between us and public works. And we need to mm -hmm. do a better job in that conversation. But I think that's part of the reason that we're saying in this next working session, we'd like to bring our sister agencies in because some of the work that we need to do, we also need their partnership with, and we need to create better processes. And we are improving our own internal com communication because now we have more people for them to talk to, which is super helpful. <laughs> um, but we also um, need to come to agreement. And we would love, for, I am aware of the efforts of Tree Eastie. Um, there's also Ellis Memorial has done some similar things in the South End. Folks who go out and really um, give us that data, we need that. Um, mm. Yeah, we have more team, we have more staff, but nobody's gonna know that neighborhood like the people that live there. Um, and so, we are really appreciate when people take the time. We've been able to, you know, sort of be transparent. This is the kind of pit we need. And we want to increase that awareness because sometimes people will ask for a tree and a place that we can't actually 
plant because it doesn't meet our requirements. But if we can do a better job of saying these are what the exact requirements are, and we have that with some groups like Tree East, like Ellsworth, where they know what the requirements are, and so then they're able to make that request. Um, if we we want to do a better job, um, and this will be the kind of thing that you know Todd begins to work on as we're doing some of that community engagement. How do we arm people with information so they know? Oh, okay. Now that I know what a tree pit needs. I can make better suggestions about where it might be or not be in our neighborhood. Because sometimes what people do is they ask and then it doesn't meet the requirements. And then we have to tell them no. And maybe if they knew just a little bit more, they would have asked a block over or across mm -hmm. the street. And that would have helped us to, to move those more quickly. Well, thank you. And I do appreciate the fact that there's already been conversations with Public Works to just try to streamline, streamline that communication and, and, and get that message out there. So thank you. Um, my, my second and, and final question is within that third bucket that you mentioned, Chief, of trees being on private land that's uh, being built for the first time or being redeveloped. We've had many development proposals that have come before the community that range from smaller renovation projects going through the ZBA on, on Thursday mornings to the mid range, which is Tuesday ZBA mornings, and then through small and, and large project article 80 review. And so I see all of those instances as checkpoints and levers for negotiation and ensuring the community gets what it deserves in terms of mitigation and protections. Um, you know, in, in addition to the expansion of our tree canopy. So what usually happens through this community process is that they promise to build street trees and certain landscaping to gain support from the abutters. They include them in their plans as they move through the ZBA process. They get their variance with approval um, or uh, uh, with design review uh, proviso with the street trees a part of the plan and then through the process they move forward and somehow their final design, they don't have street trees in the plans that have been approved. And so this is a loophole that I'm just saying to everybody that we need to figure out and somehow, and somehow codify into whatever ordinance we're pushing for, or maybe even through the rezoning of, of East Boston um, and Charlestown. But I think that there should be a way in which, and maybe it's through this notification um, system or excuse me, the, the GIS tracking system that we are able to track some of these trees that are proposed and promised and then just making sure at the end of this BBDA design review, they are actually included. And it, again, it ranges from small project all the way up to article 80 review. So one quick suggestion I would add, because I've actually experienced that too. A lot of times proponents are actually just putting out drawings. They aren't even actually making a commitment. So one thing I would say is, um, and we sometimes people have to come before the Parks Commission, so we have the opportunity to do that. It helps, of course, that Liza's sitting on there, <laughs> who's a landscape architect and knows how these processes work. But to, to even ask the question, let me clarify, are the trees that I see in this, in this drawing part of your um, final proposal? Because I will actually tell you in at least half of the cases, the answer is no. That's just a drawing that somebody made up. Yep. And, it, and it's not even actually necessarily trying to be, some of them I think are trying to be a little um, sneaky and some of them not. It's kind of standard, I mean, a friend of ours who's a good landscape architect said, it's standard process when you hire someone that the, whatever they show back to you is the most beautiful version of what you could be doing. But it doesn't actually always mean that they are making a commitment to do that. Sometimes they're showing you things that in theory would be our treat. They're not even actually saying that they're going to plant them. So I do think it's worth in the short term, while we also do the work to figure this out, to make sure that when folks are there, they just ask the question, how many trees are being taken down and how many trees are you proposing to, to replant? We want to and think it's absolutely necessary that we sit down and actually have a real process to figure that out, including the BPDA in that conversation. Um, people will be happy to note that we are, our cabinet has been meeting with the BPDA pretty significantly around questions of resilience. Um, and a lot has been focused on coastal resilience. But what a, one of the things that I've sort of said and has been welcomed and we'll keep pushing is that our, our resilience work isn't just coastal. Obviously that is important. Obviously that is dramatic. Obviously we need to close those flood paths. But keep is as important because many more people are dying from heat effects of climate change than are dying from flooding. Gotta address them both. Uh, but we do have a solid commitment from the BPDA that we want to have a resilience team that's not just about coastal. We, we can have a coastal sub team, but we also need to have 
a conversation about heat and how we're really dealing with those impacts. And so I hope that you'll continue to track that, ask about it. We are working together on that, um, but it is true that often heat keeps getting left out. And that is a particular problem because heat disproportionately impacts people of color, disproportionately impacts poor people, disproportionately impacts people who do not speak English as their first language. And so we need to, again, make sure that sea level rise is not dominating the conversation in such a way that we forget these other impacts that are quite deadly um, to people. So I, I think we, we need to keep that longer, larger conversation. I've seen exactly what you're talking about. One small hack I would say in the, in the short term is to just ask the question. I see seven trees on this drawing. Are those codified in your plan or are those just Niceties you put on here because they're just how your, the drawings came to you from your architecture firm and you actually have nothing <laughs> there. Um, just in the short term, it, it can often expose that people maybe even haven't thought about that um, and, and, and you want to push them to sort of write it down and make sure that they do. Thank you so much, Chief. And uh, Chair, that, that's it that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coletta. Uh, it's now Councillor Mejia. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you again to the administration for all your work um, and to the sponsors. I just have a few questions, and I'm hoping that um, you can provide some insight to some folks who might be tuning in so that they can really understand what is at play here. Um, more specifically, I'd like to uh, learn a little bit more about the public versus the private trees. Um, you know, if you have purchased a city-owned uh, parcel, if you a, par, a house, you know how the city acquires uh, land and then they build on it and then they sell it to you. Um, is that considered city or private once you have purchased it? Just so that for those who are tuning in, so that they can have an understanding if that piece the the the, the one that they have purchased, even though it's been from the city, is that still considered private or public? Private. If you if you own the home, if you have a deed to the home, once you it's in your hands, it is a private uh, ownership. The only um, residential land that would be impacted by what we're proposing around private, I mean around public land, would be BHA, because um, Boston Housing Authority is is you know it's it's a quasi obviously it's also a partnership with the federal government, so that's. But we have we have proposed that they be included in the conversation around public land. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. And then my second question is, and I'm just curious as, as to whether or not this exists or this would be part of the work that will be done as a result of once this gets passed, is a database of every single tree that exists in the city of Boston and who owns it. Is there such a thing already? Um, because I know that as a resident here on the street that I live on, there have been some questions as to who is responsible for particular trees. And there are some folks who don't want to take any responsibility for it because they um, are unclear if that tree belongs to them or to the house next door. And so I'm just curious if there is, um, and, and some of this might be private, um, Chief, so you may not want to, uh, you know, add private trees onto a database, but I think in terms of clarity and for just some, just for perspective for some folks, it's, I think it would be helpful for people to have a clear understanding of who owns that tree and who is responsible for the maintenance of it. Liza, did I see you wanted to lean in on, on this or you want me to start? Or? Sure. I mean, I, I think from the, um, the tree inventory work that was done as part of the urban forest plan that focused exclusively on street trees. So now we have a comprehensive street tree inventory. We have partial inventory data for certain park lands. Um, the Emerald Necklace parks uh, are, are essentially the where we have um, park inventories. We do not have any comprehensive public land tree inventory. So I think that's something we could work towards because there would be consistency of um, the city being responsible for that canopy as a whole. So I think it would take us a while to get to the point where we have a comprehensive inventory on public land. But I, we have not discussed, nor do we have a clear sense of a path forward that would produce a comprehensive 
maintainable, up-to-date inventory on private lands. Okay. So, yeah, and Councillor, probably what we would do that we have discussed as a potential is say every five years, for instance, doing yeah. some satellite data to just see what the coverage is. Uh, but I think it would be it'd be relatively untenable to sort of try to track everything on people's private land and we could get into some privacy issues around that. So I think um, we are actually proposing in this current work on public land that we actually increase that, that, um, uh, that database pretty significantly over time. <laughs> we don't think it's all gonna happen tomorrow. Um, by taking into account not just street trees, but all park trees and trees in the public right of way. So that's BHA and BPF, like a lot of folks, it's a pretty, it's not insignificant to actually grow in that direction. Um, but I think the other thing I would note is if a tree is on your property, you are responsible for it. Yeah. So Absolutely. if it's on your front yard, if it's planted in your front yard, even if the, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> The branches may go over the sidewalk. If it's on your property, you are responsible for it. Yeah, that, I, and, and I am going to do a replay in that remix of what you have just said, because <laughs> there are some people here who, uh, in certain spaces and places that I've been in, that will hoot and holler and say, I don't care. The, the deed does not say that this tree belongs to me. I think that they moved it. So there's just some you know, discrepancies with some folks. And there are some trees that are um, forward facing closer to the sidewalk area that uh, some folks uh, don't want to take responsibility for because they think it's city, it's on leaning towards closer to the sidewalk. So they think it's the city. So I'm, I, th that's the reason why I'm asking the question around just helping people understand what their responsibility is and the more uh, data that we have and, and, and facts that we can share with people, the more apt they might be willing to want to take care of that tree. Um, and, and then I have one last question in regards to, I, I believe that, uh, that the ordinance states that, you know, permission would need to be granted to remove trees. Um, and this is just for public trees, correct? not privately owned trees? Or, yes, that's that's what we are suggesting should be discussed in this first chunk of the ordinance. What we're ultimately saying is all of them should be discussed. Yeah. It's just a little bit un, um, challenging to have a conversation about so many different circumstances when they're all slightly different. Um, so I just wanna be clear, right now we're proposing for conversations on trees in uh, on public land but we're still going to get down to this conversation about trees on private land, individually owned, sort of res small residential, and then another one for private land, larger developments. Yes, I love that. And I just want to offer as we uh, move towards that direction in terms of just from a community engagement um, and outreach uh, space is that if we could start those conversations where we're meeting with people um, and helping them understand and just kind of bringing them into the conversation so that once we get to writing it up, that they have been part of the process from the get-go because there is a lot a lot of education that needs to happen here for people so that they don't think that these things are being done to them without them. So I just want to offer that, um, you know, you could lean on my office for any type of support in terms of just engagement because I think that this is something that is critically important because so many of our people are impacted but they just don't see that impact and i think if we can engage them and educate them and bring them along they won't feel uh blindsided when it's time to uh, make these hard decisions for some folks we completely agree council and and to the point that you were ma making earlier we also think that sometimes people don't realize the kind of amazing work that trees are doing for them and so, you know, as an example, I had a neighbor cut down a tree and then buy one of those um, uh, shade tents for their backyard. And, you know, I get it, but that tree could have been your natural shade tent. Like just wanting to ha have more conversations with folks about all the things that trees are doing um, to, to benefit them. But I, I, I completely agree. It's part of the reason we're suggesting breaking this up because some of the things like on the public land, we can actually have a conversation 
And that won't have a ton of impact on people and we can move those things forward and get the things we need to keep that moving. But these conversations about what happens in individual trees and in people's backyards and in neighborhoods, we agree much more engagement is needed to move that conversation in a way. Um, I, I would not like to see this go in the direction that, for instance, bike paths have. Um, mm -hmm. I remember before bike paths or, to be honest with you, dog parks, they have become, let's be honest, racialized, classized. They're, the conversation gets really problematic. And if we try to move this too quickly without um, the right conversations and the right level of engagement, I fear that trees will end up in that same place. So I, we completely agree that we need to, to do the things that can move quickly well, definitely agree with it, don't want to slow those things down, but we do need to slow down and do more engagement, particularly around the conversation on private land. Yes, and I, and I appreciate that. And I think I, what I'm really excited about is you naming explicitly the class piece of it, because I think that when we're anything that deals with change is depending on who is driving that change is how we end up um, interpreting whether or not we want to be open to that change, regardless if it's good for us. Right. So I think that that's key. And I appreciate you naming that. And then the last thing that I will say is that, you know, there are a lot of vendors who are doing business here in the city of Boston when you get a call to take down a tree and then they come in and just take down the tree. I think that there is an opportunity to even have uh, calling those folks in as well as part of this uh, education exercise that we're about to go on uh, because they, they'll make $3,000 taking down a tree and not think twice about it. And, and it, it does cost a lot to take down a tree. So uh, there's a lot of biz, a lot of money that's being made um, in that space. And I think that there's an opportunity, um, even as you continue to, you know, think through your outreach and engagement plan, how do we call some of these folks in and hold them a little bit more accountable and responsible to the tree canopy um, conversation as well. And that's all for my questions. And thank you, Chair, and thank you to the sponsors and to the administration for your thoughtful um, leadership in this space. That's all for me. Thank you, Councillor uh, Mejia. Uh, we're going to go to Tanya, uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, and then um, I will I will then ask my questions, and then we can do a second round for folks who still have questions uh, for folks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, mm -hmm. everyone. Um, Chief, I wonder if you could give me, um, if you're able to populate the priority zones in an outline so that um, to Councilor Lujan's point, updates of disaggregating data, just um, building out the list of maybe, I don't know if it's, if we do it by neighborhood or if we do it by block. <laughs> um, but I think that gives people a real context. So when you're starting in certain areas, um, folks will see it from a list from one to, from A to Z or from one to a hundred or whatever. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, and we, we can do that. I, I, I think Liza is actually trying to pull up some of the data uh, right now. But um, what I can say is um, I, I can sort of rattle off pretty quickly some of the places that are most deeply affected by heat because that's one of the things really sort of driving us. Um, and so, um, Liza, are you finding those, yes, those, those uh, we're trying to see if we can get them up quickly. Um, East Boston, clearly. Um, actually pretty much most of the entire neighborhood. Um, we also know that Chinatown is one of the places most impacted. Nubian Square also has some challenges around heat. Grove Hall, thank God for uh, Franklin Park though. Grove Hall, a lot of its heat is attenuated by being so close to, um, to Franklin Park, but um, Nubian Square does not have those same advantages. Um, Liza, my, I, Mattapan Square has some, but not as, uh, bad, but it has some. Um, it's it's it is uh, mitigated a bit by having quite a few green zones around it. From my um, and then there's parts of Dorchester, actually parts some of the parts that I live in. Um, over to uh, here we go. Yeah, I was looking at this, um, but this doesn't actually do it justice for the public. Um, You're saying you want you want um, it to be sort of the the areas to be named. 
Yeah, so I know that Lower Roxbury happens to be number two on suffering from heat islands in mm -hmm. Boston. Um, yet I wouldn't I wouldn't know that if I was just looking at the website, I wouldn't know that by looking at this map because okay. I could see, okay, well, here's District 7 in the middle somewhere. Yep. Um, and then I, I and then I look at it and I say, oh, well, they, I know that that's Franklin Park. That big green is Franklin Park. Um, Would it help, Council Fernandez, if, if we could put this on top of a map that just has the neighborhood names and lines? Because it's, would that, would that improve it at all? Yeah, that would. And then what would be really, really helpful for the conversation about prioritizing um, by equity, um, equity first, then mm -hmm. a, a list, number one to number, or maybe it's fate, maybe it's categories as you would have it here. So the priority zones where it's black, the color is black, and then the, in that block, you have like East Boston, Chinatown, Lower Roxbury. And then you go to phase two or the second priority um, areas, okay. and then you're listing those neighborhoods. And then I think that is a more clear conversation as to what is, where is priority? Okay. Build on we those. can, we can uh, probably try to name some of them where you see where it says number four overlapping. Some of those actually have real names to them. But I right. think what we could do is both, both give this so that people can see, because sometimes there are priority zones in a neighborhood, but it's a small area. And, but, but yeah, I think we could try to yeah, just na what I'm hearing from you is like names that people people would recognize instead of just the map. Right. And okay. I, and I like your idea with the map and actually putting the names. But again, that's a search. That's a that's that's some homework. People have to go through and zoom in and look at things. But a list is more clear. Okay. Um, well, we we question? can do that and and lead people here. I think because some of some of the zones like. Don't don't evenly map overlapping. Place, but we can I think we can say to people we'll do here are some recognizable names and for more detail we encourage you to look at the map and then that way we didn't throw out places that might not have a an easy yeah. name but we've also given people some more clarity. Yeah, we could. Sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, it's it sounds like you know your office, you, your office, uh, your leadership, and CAB has done very thoughtful, very thorough work here. You can tell that it's taken an extensive um, work and, and thoughtfulness to put this together in terms of um, prioritizing equity. And in just the way you've explained um, in response to Council Coletta's questions, in terms of your approach to prioritizing the people in the neighborhoods in terms of community engagement as well. So I just wanted to point out that I appreciate that. I wonder if um, you can, so thank you for uh, for agreeing to question one. Um, I wonder if you could submit a list of the cab members and the neighborhood that they uh, live in. You're muted. We have the, yeah. the cab members sorry, part in the urban forest plan document, all who were comfortable being recognized. You know, we asked if people were comfortable with having their name published. And so everyone who was um, is published in the plan and we can um, provide a link um, after this. If they're not, should we not, um, hi Lisa, should we not make this transparent? Why would it be private to not to not know who they are. So just ask clear. people if they were comfortable with being in a public doc, having their name in a public document, and a couple people said no. I see. And I and I know that, for instance, there is somebody at my congregation, for instance, who's a survivor of domestic violence, um, who does not participate in Facebook or anything like that. Be it just because she does, even though it's been years, still does not feel comfortable and doesn't want to be found. So there's, we do, we try to honor people if they don't, if they That's want to keep it private. It's not the majority of people. It's not the majority of people. It's like two, right, Liza? Yeah, sure. So, That's totally yeah, understandable. So, um, circumstances, sure, for privacy. Can we just but, um, list them by demographics and neighborhood if that's the case? Okay, maybe we could, yeah, we could do, yes. We could, we could send that. We didn't put them in the urban forest plan, but we could, if they're, I think there were two. 
I think Thank it you. was okay. You mentioned um, in your presentation, I noticed that there will be opportunities for obviously new employment um, and putting together your team and uh, for this project. And I wonder um, what is the equitable for select the equitable for selection of employees um, or equity plan for selection of employees moving forward. I, I, I only mentioned that and I know that this is not a reflection of you, um, Chief, but um, I only mentioned that because I know that parks um, needs a lot of support in terms of um, whether it's workforce or pathways to upper management for black and brown employees. Um, so I wonder what are I know I know that you are someone who thinks with a, an, an equitable lens. Mm -hmm. I wonder what is your plan in terms of moving forward, increasing um, black and brown people in upper management as well as increasing pay, or in terms of the new employees coming in. Yep. How are you thinking about that? Great. Yeah, I'm glad you asked because we actually did look at this. So a couple of things, as you as you already noted, and it's just true. Uh, urban forestry is an overwhelmingly white and male uh, profession. That's just true. <laughs> um, and, and so that's a huge reason that um, Power Corps took on urban forestry as its first module to really train people um, because the jobs are there and our folks could do that work if they had the exposure and the training and support to be able to do that. Um, and so we are now opening up our frontline jobs and we have actually set it up so that a power core certificate counts as a form of um, certification that allows uh, power core uh, graduates to have a particularly strong chance at <laughs> um, getting our entry level jobs um, and and it matches what the, the skill set that they've already have. The second thing that we did is for our next layer of jobs, four, four persons, we actually started by offering the training internally to uh, current members of the parks uh, and rec maintenance division. And so we had some folks who took up on getting the training uh, and are going to be able to apply into those jobs. So we actually were pretty proactive um, now, there does come a point at which at some of the higher level jobs, you have to have some of the certifications that people did not have. But on the on getting people in in places where there wasn't a barrier around having to have a degree or having to have the specific certifications, we did actually look specifically um, at how we could make it an on ramp for uh, folks of color, particularly who are from the neighborhoods that we are looking at, at starting off and in focusing on um, most closely. The next piece will really be what is the process by which people do the continuing education so that they can move up? Because there's not nearly enough arborists of color. And trust me, we try to turn over a lot of rocks and figure that out. Um, they're just not enough in the state and they're not enough around the country. And so we actually need to make sure that there's a pathway while people are working, while people are part of this, to also figure out how do they continue to get the additional certifications needed. So in Power Corps, for instance, they did get their, uh, what is it, insect, no, is it insecticide applicator? What is it, pest applicator training? That's what it is, right, Max? I think I got the right, the right title. Anyway, um, so that they can actually also be part of helping us with uh, fighting emerald ash borer, which is a concern that we've been looking at and trying to address within our trees. Uh, but we need to make sure that they can continue to get um, additional certifications. Uh, but I'm really, I'm really excited uh, that we sort of made those two particular provisions so that we would have an opportunity to make an out, a, a space for black and brown folks to get in on the ground floor in a, in a um, space that is growing more and more communities, more and more cities are paying attention to their, to their uh, canopy. So we certainly don't want to lose them to anywhere else. Um, but we are excited um, to be putting them on a path that has a lot of expansion potential. Thank you. Um, sounds exciting. Uh, very thoughtful once again. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, just one more question. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Thank you. Um, how can the council um, or my office um, support you with the community engagement process and how do you see that um, taking place? 
Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I can actually, I have three ready-made answers that I want to mm -hmm. think about. So I think there's, um, in this process, uh, I think it'll be good. I'm looking forward to bringing in some of our sister uh, uh, city agencies. I think um, we are ready to lead on this and uh, we are, ex we, we think that there is also a plus to some of these conversations being, uh, allowing other cities agencies that have an important role to play to join the more public process. Uh, because I think that they are an important part of the picture. And right now it feels like everyone's only talking to us and we want that conversation to be expanded. So one piece of that is already sort of happening um, in the fact that um, Council the Royal has already started setting up some of those working sessions that give us an opportunity to bring a full picture of folks who are in this, who need to be in this conversation in. So that's one. The second is, um, as was raised before, for instance, uh, organizations like Tree Eastie really sit down and figure out where can more trees be planted. And we need that in every neighborhood. And I, I want to just note that we don't have enough of that in our EJ neighborhoods. So I would love to talk about partnering on how we get um, a cohort of folks in Roxbury that are out asking where can more trees go? Uh, because we can show up, we can make sure that the pits are good, we can put in the orders, but people know their neighborhoods and they know their streets in a way that, right. I don't, if we, if we'd have to have 500 staff to have that kind of knowledge that we're gonna get from neighborhood-based groups. And so opening those doors to the neighborhood-based groups, one for us to talk about street trees. I think the third piece to that is we need more neighborhood-based groups to join this tree alliance. The whole goal of the tree alliance was to create an opportunity um, for everything from large nonprofits to the small neighborhood association to get excited about tree planting and to get excited about talking to their neighbors and thinking about where more trees can be. There's work that we definitely need to do and we're willing to do that and we wanna have the conversations with folks, but nobody's gonna be as effective talking to a neighbor into getting a tree as another neighbor. And how do we get to the point um, where particularly in some of our under canopy neighborhoods, we have tree advocates who are neighbors who can talk to other folks, people who look like them. I, I'm, you know me, I keep it real and I don't mince words. To date and still, even in this call, the folks that consider themselves tree advocates are not racially and economically reflective of the city of Boston. It's right. just, it's not there. Well, but the I'm, benefits and the burdens of our, of the benefits of our tree canopy should be coming to our communities and the burden of not having a tree canopy is, is impacting a lot of folks who are not at the table. So in so much as you, I know you um, convene those D, D7 round tables, like we'll come out. We would love to talk to people. We'd love to figure out how people can be part of this. Uh, because as I said, with the bike conversations, with the dog park conversations, I, I, it will break my heart if trees start moving in that direction where right. we're not even actually talking about the merits of them anymore. They're just becoming a battle between different racial, economic groups within the city of Boston. That I, I cannot see it go that way. That's absolutely, and you, I think, and multiple different counselors, I would love, please bring us out to those neighborhood groups. Um, I, I don't, I well, hate I'm glad to, to hear you. Out. I'm glad to oh. hear you uh, say that you are so open to our an environmental anti-displacement project. Um, <laughs> we have a committee, a subcommittee that's working on this and we'd love to partner with you and I look forward to the work. Love to be. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, so I'm gonna ask my questions and we can do a second round uh, for folks that are still here. If you have a second round, uh, just raise your hand uh, and I will go to you and then we will go to community comment. Um, so quick question related to tree removal uh, that's happened in the last like two, two to three years. Um, a number of our street trees were unhealthy uh, and there was a lot of removal. So I, I represent uh, District 5, that's High Park, Rosendale, Mattapan. And so in High Park and Rosendale, it was like noticeable removal. In some streets, it was the entire street of street trees you would see just go away. Uh, and in that time, 
We have not seen replacement trees at, at the same pace. Uh, and so is there a, like a tally on how many street trees we lost as a city? Because I know there was a disease and trees were diseased and there was other issues at, at play. Um, no trees that weren't supposed to be removed were removed. I guess the question is, how many trees were removed and how many have been replaced of those removed? So I, I think, Max, it might make sense for you to talk about that because I think it's both disease and, and a, you know, a number of different things. But the other thing is that um, we've also improved how we're, what we're deciding is a good place to put a tree pit in an attempt not to have to do this again um, in the near future. So that, I'll pass it over to Max to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I would first say I would, I would love to know which street it is particularly because I can't think of one where we've removed an entire uh, street of trees. Um, second, I would say that every tree that we do remove, um, there's a reason behind it, whether it's disease, insect, or uh, it's a hazard. Um, second or third, uh, every tree that we inspect for removal is inspected by two arborists. Well, you know, first there's a, the initial inspection that is done by the staff arborists that work for me, and second, by myself, I'm the final determiner of, of what tree is removed in the city based on the state law. Um, so there's always at least two eyes that, that are looking at the trees that are removed, and then every tree that is removed in the city goes automatically back on our replant list. So if a street tree is removed, we automatically look to see if it's a replacement. Unfortunately, because of all of the requirements that we have to follow or fortunately for all the requirements we have to follow for ADA compliance, uh, proximity to intersections, curb cuts, uh, proximities to people's front doorways, uh, fire hydrants, um, stop signs, uh, overhead lamps, street lights, uh, signal lights, there, you know, underground utilities. Anytime that there's a gas line underground, electrical line underground, a water line underground, we have to have a certain amount of distance away from those utilities. So it is very difficult for us to replace a lot of these trees. Um, so we're up against a lot of different uh, uh, aspects, whether they are underground or above ground. Um, that we have to look at where, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we used to just plop a tree in the ground, right? And that's why we got to this point where, you know, a tree doesn't last for seven years. In seven years, that tree dies, right? Because we never thought about those things that were really gonna impact the tree. When you drive down Hyde Park Ave, you'll notice that a lot of these trees are dying for numerous reasons, whether it's because we put down way too much salt in the city and that salt spray destroys the bark of these trees and then they, and then the trees start to die, or whether it's car accidents knocking them over, or whether it's because the gas company is constantly digging up the roadway and putting in new gas lines, right? Like one of our number one uh, uh, killers of street trees is construction. It's never ending in our city. So we constantly have, you know, uh, contractors excavating within the critical root zone of our trees. And that's one of the things that we are proposing in our ordinance is that no construction is done within the critical root zone of our trees without our permission, without us knowing, or without an arborist being on site. Because when that, that construction is done, uh, they are killing, in essence, killing that tree or making it unstable. And then that tree's falling over in a storm. Uh, and then when we try to go to replace that tree, we can't replace the tree because now there's a gas line right next to it. Um, we also uh, give residents the opportunity to allow, uh, allow them to say, no, they don't want a tree plant in front of their house. Even though I can you know, talk to residents until I'm blue in the face about the importance of trees, uh, sometimes they just don't really want them in front of their house, whether it's because the tree fell over in a storm or they, they really want that parking spot in front of their house or because the tree drops leaves or makes a mess. You know, there are a myriad of issues that, that people might not want a tree in front of their house. Um, so we really do try at every single opportunity to replay, plant a tree where one was removed, or at least within, you know, 15, 20 feet of where one was removed. There are a lot of instances where we're just unable to because, you know, maybe the sidewalk isn't ADA compliant anymore, right? If you go into certain neighborhoods, the sidewalks are just a mess and, and we can't plant a new tree somewhere where the sidewalk is already not ADA compliant because it's unfair to that population of our of our constituency. Um, so, so we're up against a lot of obstacles as it is. Um, but I can say for a fact that every single tree that we remove, we do attempt to replace. And since I have been here, we have replanted more trees than we have ever removed. Whether that means, you know, that we have lost trees in storms or we've systematically removed them, we have always planted more trees than we have removed. Um, so we do try no matter what to, to replant where we remove a street tree, um, but we are up against a lot of obstacles and a lot of them are utilities. 
Uh, a lot of them are, you know, uh, homeowners themselves who might not want them. Uh, and a lot of them are just day-to-day -day, uh, things that go on without the city with car accidents or construction. I appreciate that uh, very uh, well thought out answer. Qu uh, but quick question, do we, do we keep those numbers? Do we, do we have the numbers on how many trees are moving, how many trees are planted? Absolutely. Yeah, if I had internet in my office right now, I could uh, ring those out for you really quickly. <laughs> and I'm sorry, sorry that I sound terrible right now. I have a sinus infection. I lost my voice. No, so I appreciate I'm you. I appreciate you being on. Uh, if we can, you can send me those numbers later. Uh, the reason I bring it up is this. Uh, so, for instance, on my street, on Faraday Street, maybe about 80% of the trees were taken down. But at this point, um, I think a vast majority of them have been replanted which has actually been really great. So like in the last year, I think they did the whole stretch within the last year, uh, but these are all obviously very young trees and the hope is that they that they make it. Um, and I see my neighbors doing their part and I've seen the cars come by and do their part. The reason I ask is because I, I've had constituents who have lost their trees ask me, how do I get another tree? Uh, and generally speaking, what that has led us to do is sort of go and do a 311 sort of request for a tree. But it, and what I'm, is what I'm hearing that if a tree was chopped down, if the reason they are requesting that tree is because it was cut down by the city, that the city has already put them on that list? Yeah, so, yeah so if we remove a tree for any reason, it automatically goes in for replanting. And then some constituents do uh, make a request on their own um, for the tree to be replanted on top of our systematic automatic replanting. Uh, and some residents, you know, if there's not a tree in front of their house, uh, they make a request to have a tree planted. And those are the requests I need the most, right? If we're gonna increase the canopy in our city, I need the residents who don't have the tree in front of their house to make those 301 requests, um, because those are the only ways that we're going to cut new tree pits and, and increase our canopy. So those are, the, those are the constituents that I'm looking for the most, the ones who don't have trees planted in front of their sidewalks right now. Which is great, because what I see all the time is places where we could put trees on sidewalks. Now, but bearing the fact that I don't know what you just brought up, which is where those underground pipes are and things like that. So those might be getting in the way. But I think one of the, the whole sort of place I'm trying to go with this is we do mailings to residents from the city of Boston for things like winter resources or winter guides. Have we done and are we open to doing a mailing on this is how you request a tree for your home. These are the care and maintenance tips so that they can survive and just send that out into the city so that we actually have places that because I think a vast number of individuals in the city would say, oh, wow, a tree. Yeah, I got to do this and I can get a tree. But I think that that's I, I, I just think that's a good idea if we haven't done that yet or if we haven't done a mailing of that sort to the city. We do it for winter. Uh, resource guides. We do it for all kinds of different things where we send out a citywide mailer for those sort of resources. We should probably do one that's tree and nature focused at some point, just about ways to maintain and, and preserve trees, uh, but also ways to request trees, especially if we're trying to get new requests in, because I, I, that's not a natural process. I don't think most people even know. I think they just think the city comes and brings them, right? Like the city's either going to come and bring it or not, and I either win that lottery or I don't. I don't think that there's an understanding from most individuals in the city that you can literally put in a request for a tree. Um, and so it would make sense to me if we did one of those mailings uh, to the city. I don't know if we've ever done one or if there's one scheduled or if that's something that you guys would be open to. I personally would be very open to it. Anytime I talk to ONS staff or staff from city council office, I always try to promote talking to residents about promoting um, you know, the 311 or just going to the Parks Department's website where it literally details, you know, all the ways you can care for a street tree and uh, the ways, you know, you can care for a young tree. Also, every new tree we plant, we leave a, a leave behind on the tree itself onto the stake that says how you can aim the tree and water the tree. Um, you know, not sometimes they get ripped off the tree itself, but, uh, you know, it's a helpful uh, uh, leave behind that tells you exactly what you can do for the first two years of maintaining that tree. Um, but yeah, I'm totally for that. I mean, the more requests we can get for planting uh, new trees, uh, the better, you know, and especially if you can leave your contact information with 311, uh, anonymous requests don't get an email response uh, when you close out your 311 request, right? Because I spend a lot of time closing out cases with very detailed responses. I don't 
close the case and just say, noted, we're not going to do something here. I tell you exactly why we're not going to do something here or exactly why we can't plant a tree here. Uh, but if you don't leave your email address, uh, then you're not going to get that 3-1-1 case closure note. Um, so that's just a very important thing for constituents to know that if you leave your email address and contact information, you're going to get a, an actual response from a person in our division. Thank you for that. That's that's very helpful. And so I'm going to personally pursue with the administration. I'm going to be a nuisance and try to get that mailer sent out so that we can get that done. Uh, so that's that's a thing that I'm going to be trying to do. Uh, just because I think there's there's low hanging fruit on the the sort of right of way and street sort of trees. Uh, and I think there's a lot of folks that would would actually if you gave them that kind of a flyer or that kind of a, a postcard or mailing would be helpful to them to sort of know, hey, we could do that. Um, and so yeah. I'll do I that. In, I would say in Hyde Park alone, you have a lot of grass planting strips that don't have trees in it. And when I uh -huh. drive by- Drives me nuts, drives me nuts. I see them all the time and I'm just like, I wish, I'm glad that the, the ones that have been cut are on a replacement list because in some cases they're cut. So on, High Park is luckily one of the ones with more tree canopy for the city. Uh, we're blessed in that. And so some of the trees that were cut are very old trees. We're talking about large calipers. And they're not, they're not strategically placed in such a way where they're necessarily directly in front of one home or directly in front of another home. And so those trees that sort of are in strips where they never truly belong to any one house I always wondered, do I got to put in a request for that? Does that person have to come on and put a request for that? I'm, ha I'm grateful to hear that we have an automatic, if the tree was cut, we're, we're looking to put that in. Because we have a lot of stumps in certain areas that are just sort of there. Um, and so that's helpful for me to know uh, that that has happened. But I would love to see all of the sort of places where we have these strips for trees taken advantage of uh, in a real way. And so I think that's a good aspect. And it might be one of those things where maybe that list can even be tailored to areas where we know you could plant a tree, right? So we're not mailing downtown Boston if they don't have actual spaces to request a tree, right? Or we're not, you know, that we're being targeted in how we do that so that we can actually get into neighborhoods that can actually take it. Um, yeah, that was uh, one of the parts of the urban forest master plan was part of the mapping was to find sidewalks that were wide enough uh, and already <laughs> our specifications for planting because, you know, there are parts of the city uh, that are not compliant for planting the sidewalks don't meet the minimum widths for ADA compliance to install a tree pit. Um, so yeah, we that is data that we do have, and um, that's something we could all work together uh, towards a goal of uh, yeah, treeing those trees. Yeah, so that's that's going to be a thing I'm just going to take on. We'll figure that out, and I'll I'll bother the appropriate people in the city to to get that funded and done. Um, a secondary question about the or the ordinance that we're doing right now, and I just want to make sure public's aware. This isn't a situation where we're going to do one working session or one hearing and move. There's there's a lot of pieces to this. And so uh, I believe what I'm hearing, uh, Chief Reverend, is that if we can sort of set up, uh, and I want to back to that other point that I think is incredibly important, making sure that multiple uh, communities and classes and folks of different racial and ethnic backgrounds are in these spaces. If we can create uh, working sessions that take into part sort of community advocacy groups, but also communities themselves uh, to the best of our ability. Can we get your participation in those as we set those up, when we set those up? Is that something you'd be able to do? Yeah, yeah. And what I'm part of what I'm suggesting is the first chunk, we take the thing that probably people are the least interested in, um, which is the, the, pri the public land piece, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of that already a lot of that already exists. What we're trying to do with that is take the processes that we already have and strengthen them a bit. So as an example, like we have a tree warden, Max is our tree warden. We already have a we already have a process for reviewing things, all of those pieces. What we're at what we're suggesting is that we add into to, um, our review process other pieces of public land that might not. I mean, our team is here. We we hire people who love trees. I mean, they're here because they want trees to survive. They know what they add to other departments. And I'm not saying they're anti-tree. It's just the often the decision is being made by someone who is also maintaining like the brickwork. 
right? And so what we're saying is we want to take a little bit more responsibility for our all trees and in, in, in the city's properties to make sure that the decisions about them and the support of them are made by people who love trees and not just people who do construction or you know, other pieces like that. Um, and so I think that that's what we're, we, we want to start. We are more than willing to do public engagement. And this is the kind of thing that's probably not going to impact people directly as much, right? Um, and so they, it, it may be the piece of it that people are a little less excited about, but we're definitely willing to go out there. Where I, I would say we really want to go out there <laughs> is on the pieces that sort of impact people most directly. Um, and I would love to put together a, a engagement schedule around that, that, that starts, I mean, we could either be, we could even be moving this and start the conversation on the next Oh, Are we layer. absolutely, yeah, um, that's what I expect we'll do. That, so, that's that would, yeah. so just to be clear for everybody listening, I think the public protections, beefing that up, making it so that it's working in a way that most prioritizes what makes it effective, uh, and what you have seen, Chief Reverend, in, in terms of what, like, these are little places where there's there's sort of holes in it or where we can make it stronger. I think there's vast um, buy-in on that. I don't think there's anybody who has, like, a, a difference of opinion necessarily on strengthening or beefing up the, the public land protections. And so what I want to do with that is we'll take those aspects of this, we'll pass those first, We'll get those out of the way as quickly as we can so that those those things that have wide consensus and ability to be enforced almost immediately, uh, we'll get out the door. The second aspect of this is sort of, you know, I made a joke when we were doing things like redistricting where I would say this is the hearing on this and this is the hearing on everything else, right? So like the, <laughs> the second one uh, is, is sort of moving the private land protections. And I wanna be like clear that I see that as sort of, and I think you do as well, two different sorts of private land. There's people who own single family homes who have a tree in the backyard that they may wanna remove that for whatever reason. And then there's developers who purchase plots of land and then just wanna clear cut all of the trees on that land, right? Um, and so those are two separate different problems that require, I think, two separate different approaches to the, the person who you know wants to cut the single tree in the backyard to the person who's buying property to completely clear cut it. Um, and then there's that fourth thing, which is the fund. And this is one of those places, one of the frustrating aspects of this, and I think this is why community organization and community work uh, matters, is that one of the things that was raised often was we had the fine in this in this primary like in this just the the draft the first draft the fine was at a hundred dollars i think for a tree um and the issue that we got back was well that's not enough money that's not a lot of money that's not going to stop people from cutting trees and the reality is for regular single family homes depending on what that income is in those homes that's a lot of money if you're talking about a developer there's no amount of money that we can make this fine that they're actually going to to not cut trees for. We see this right. all the time with IDP and things like that, where they pay that price rather than create the affordable housing or to, to basically say, hey, we're gonna pay an exorbitant amount of money to not do that thing. I think one of the things that I have thought about, and this is for that later working session. So when I'm saying working sessions, I'm thinking simultaneously, we'll have a working session to figure out the things that can be passed immediately. That's the public land protection stuff but we'll do other working sessions to get that second half done. And I think we can do those things simultaneously. I think one of the things that I just want to put on the radar, I think you guys already know it, is I see those as two different things. I see single family homeowners who have a tree or a tree in the front or the back of their home differently than I see a developer with lots of resources coming into a plot of land. And so I think maybe trying to figure out ways in which we can structure a fine system that addresses those two different realities, whether it's it's by, you know, I think maybe not necessarily, uh, I think that's the stuff that needs to get sort of worked out, essentially. Yep. How do we how do we treat these two things as separate things within the ordinance? Uh, because I don't think that the uh, fine that a developer can, su can support is different than the fine that a person who, who has just bought a home or owns a home and is a senior or whatever is trying to take care of a tree in the backyard and it, they're having issues. Whatever that may be, those are two different costs and those yep. are two different yep. problems and they should be treated that way. I think there's also sort of um, one of the things I'm cognizant of for folks who are wondering like, well, what's the issue with this? I don't think anybody on this call 
doesn't believe that private trees need protection and that we should be creating policies to protect them. Uh, and so I don't, so just when people are writing or calling or talking to each other about this, it's not that the city or the councilors disagree that there needs to be protections for private trees. The issue that we come into is sort of practical enforcement issues, which is there's a lot of trees, there's a lot of homes. How do we make sure that we're policing that in terms of how they're being inspected, who's keeping up on that, what are the processes, who is in charge of those processes, knowing that we have manpower and just actual human capital cost to all of that, that might exceed pretty far what we've done in the past. I mean, we are, I'm grateful that we are hiring three arborists. When I first got here, I believe we had exactly one for the entire city. I believe that's where, and that was, and just so people know, I'm not very old on the council. I got here in 2020. We had exactly one. So much so that Councillor Bach and myself, when we were pushing for another arborist, would joke to each other about, oh, look, we're doubling the amount of arborists because you're, you're literally just adding one additional arborist. And so to be where we are now in three years is, is a mark of uh, good faith, I guess, by the city to show that this is a real issue that we want to address. But that also tells you the problem that we have in trying to enforce something that is citywide. And what I'm very cognizant of is not creating something that has very strong protections, but that everybody ignores, which we've done in the past with other things. For instance, I just put something forward on food waste. The state put something forward on food waste and their food waste issue was just composting. And they had a horrible time trying to enforce that and get compliance. And so I'm, I wanna make sure that folks are cognizant as, as one of the lead sponsors. My goal here is to create something that has teeth that has the ability to be enforced, that has the ability to be operationalized, not just to create something that says a lot of things that we want it to say, but that everybody at the table knows that we don't have the ability to actually implement at this time. And so the goal here is to take the things we can implement right now, take the harder things that involve private land, work on that throughout this year, pass that this year, that's passing this year, but making sure that we have a, a sort of on-ramp to that, where we're doing community process, where we're doing sort of what are ways in which we can creatively solve this problem and how do we do that? Uh, it, because there, there's so many aspects to that that are moving. And so from our community partners, I'm grateful the way that y'all are tuned into it and the way that you've sent us edits. We will be tapping into that as we move forward. Uh, but I, I just want folks to understand that I know everybody on this call understands there's a public and there's a private aspect to this. And most people want to see that private uh, enforcement more than they want to see that public enforcement aspect of this because there's already some public protections on the books and there's no private protections on the books. But that private one is the one where we really have to incubate it and make sure that we're doing it correctly. Um, and so that's not really a question as much as it's a statement, <laughs> but uh, for uh, the chief or whoever it's most appropriate to answer this, you did send us a bunch of red lines uh, essentially to beef up the uh, public land protections. Can you just give us a sense of both what, what's in there that the administration is saying, hey, these are things that we would love to see first. We know we can get this out the door. What are those things? How do they change uh, your abilities that you currently have right now or you don't have right now? Or do they streamline or make them better? What are the ways in which the red lines that you've presented for these changes, which we will go over in a working session, but sort of the general you don't have to go point by point, just a general over analysis of what are the things that we are getting uh, better at if we use sort of your suggestions and your edits for public land protection and any other aspect of it that we can get out in this first in this first wave. So I, I'll start from the big picture and then other people are welcome to, to join in. So I think the first piece that we're really taking on is that currently, um, as you noted, we had we used to have one two arborists. It was very um, hard to really cover a lot of the city, and so we really kept our purview to what we had the ability to actually oversee. Now, what we're saying is that we again maintain control of street trees and and park trees, but we are also saying that we want to more explicitly partner with our sister agencies across the city to oversee other forms of trees that are on public land. Up until this point, if BPS handles their trees, that's their business. If uh, BHA does something with trees, it's their, like we are, what we're trying to do is say, actually across the city, across the municipality, 
we want to take some level of responsibility for overseeing the fullness of the canopy um, across all the public land. Um, that's pretty huge uh, because that will also eventually allow us to, uh, the conversation we had earlier, which is that right now we only have good data for um, street trees. We are creating data for park trees, but there's lots of other kinds of trees that we have no data about. Um, and so this would mean we would actually do some work to actually pull together all that data so that we could track it. And then we are not saying that we would do all the work. So I'll give an example. BHA is about to do some sort of change. We would ask them, for instance, to hire an arborist and submit that paperwork to um, a tree warden so that we can see what's happening and we can pay attention to, are we losing calibers, are we not? And then we can enter in a conversation with them that says, you're cutting down half these trees, we need you to replace them. What's the viability of doing that? What is your plan? So that we just, are, we're managing the fullness of the of the canopy across all the public agencies. And we've begun those conversations with them. Um, and we're already in conversation with them because sometimes they're doing things that, you know, impact the canopy. And so um, this gives us a better ground on which to hold the entire tree canopy um, together as one thing that we are, um, managing across all those agencies. So that's one of the important pieces. I do also want to, I don't know if, oh, Max, you are still here. There were some specific things that you had um, around current processes where I think that you've done a, you were really clear about where some of those things were uh, lacking. Did you want to highlight a couple of those things that you added to the, to the uh, language? So, oh, another quick thing. There was a whole bunch of language about the tree warden in the original. We are keeping that, but we just wanted to clarify because some of the original ordinance changed the ward, the tree warden structure that we actually use. And so we we want to keep the structure that we use because it's been codified and, and practiced, but there's a couple things um, that, uh, that were added. So passing this over to Max, who is our tree warden. Yeah, so... As I talked about previously, um, you know, one of the main things is uh, the protection to the tree's root system, the critical root zone of a tree, um, very important. And one of the reasons that we lose a lot of trees during storms is because trees, uh, their root system gets, uh, well, we'll call it destroyed by uh, development, construction, utilities, et cetera. Uh, so as part of our proposed ordinance, uh, we have discussed and proposed that uh, any work affecting the critical root zone would need approval by the city tree warden, sign off by the city tree warden, as well as uh, an arborist on site during said work uh, to make sure that the root system of our city owned trees, public shade trees are not affected in a negative way that would cause them to be hazardous then to the public. Because uh, what we find often is that uh, after you know utilities are installed, uh, these are street trees, city trees, uh, then fall over in a, in a storm event. Uh, so that's you know one thing that we currently uh, do not have as part of chapter 87 uh, is a strong uh, wordage around um, the protection to the tree's root system, which is extremely important when it comes to the health and safety of our trees. Uh, so that is something that we're really trying to codify in this document is uh, that protection in and of itself. Chapter 87 does a really good job in protecting the canopy and the trunk of the tree, uh, but not so much the underground aspect of it. Um, so that's one of our, our main parts of it. Um, and after that, uh, it just goes into a further uh, strengthening of Chapter 87. The law itself is, you know, 100 plus years old. So the parts that we have added to it really strengthen our ability to uh, really focus the law on what Boston itself needs really gives myself and uh, our designees as well as our tree board. Um, our tree board will you know, be strengthened by the addition of Todd as the, as the director of the Urban Forestry Division uh, and really explains to the public what the tree board will really be made of so that everyone is aware who's involved in the tree board. Um, it also goes into the spe specifics of uh, the qualifications of the tree warden. Um, it says you know, specifically uh, that I have to be a certified arborist, it says that I have to be a tree risk assessment qualified arborist. Uh, it says that I have to have a Massachusetts pesticide license, all of which I have had for the 13 years that I've been working for the city of Boston. But now it's more of a uh, people can really know the qualifications that I have 
uh, and the reasons that I uh, am able to make these decisions about, you know, the hazardous and risk conditions of treat and what puts me uh, in the place that I am as the um, person in charge of all the trees throughout the city. One other thing that we want to note is that we also will get moving on. We haven't codified, we do not want it to be a commission because that's not what the, um, the, the urban forest plan suggested that we have a tree committee, but they said um, that, that it be actually a little bit more fluid, allowing people to join and, uh, and having spaces for people to have be on subcommittees that are not necessarily like, a, you know, appointed commissioners. So we will be doing that. Um, and we just put a nod to it in here, uh, but we wanna actually launch that. And we're actually hoping that that's something we could launch as part of this process. Am I frozen? Oh no, okay, good, okay, I can see other people. All right, um, so there were a number of things that we put in here, but most of it was, um, we did uh, include a codification, as Max said, of his, um, of his role in alignment with what's sort of already there. Um, and, you know, but the, the biggest thing is that we now have a term called city property trees. Um, and that's not just parks trees. That's all of the trees on um, city land. And that is a pretty significant change, but we can do that now because we have the adequate staff to be able to move in that direction. There was no way we could have done that even a year ago. Um, and, and I wanna just, and it will have to get phased in over time because we, as people have noted, we have a lot of backlogs, um, but it, it allows us to look more holistically as the entire city's, um, the, all of the canopy that's on city land. Thank you, I had to switch over to uh, my phone. I am now having internet issues, but I heard the entire thing. Uh, my, my computer just froze. Uh, so Councillor Braden sent me her question because she had to step off. So I'm gonna ask you her question for her second round. Um, I did have a follow-up question uh, that I will ask after the, the question from Councillor Braden. I wanna give Councillor Laura a chance to uh, answer or ask any questions that she, she has on her second round. Councillor Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, so one, I just want to thank you for all of your work on this and thank Councillor Anderson and Councillor Whitehammond for their comments, <laughs> um, particularly around how do we do environmental justice work with a racial equity lens. Um, as you know, the, my constituents are really big proponents of trees and dog parks <laughs> and, and the such. And as um, somebody who grew up, whose first introduction to environmental justice came from a black organization and black elders doing organizing work at ACE and with REAP, uh, I also feel that tension um, and kind of like that yearning to wanna make sure that this work does not move in that direction. Um, I feel like we've fought for a really long time as black and brown people to reclaim what is ours and what we've, you know, what's always been not only, that, not only the things that we've been the most impacted by, but the work that we've been at the forefront of for so long that in the past few years, it has felt like we're moving backwards <laughs> um, to kind of like relinquishing ownership over things that are really central to our communities, um, to the people who are not most directly impacted by them. So I just wanted to, um, to lift that up because I know it's a really crucial part of this work and I often find myself in the middle of trying to put the stake in the ground um, for those kinds of issues. Um, I have a question, Chief Whitehammond, you were very clear in terms of needs and how we could be supportive around membership into the Tree Alliance. Can you talk about what, the pro what that process looks like, what joining the Tree Alliance looks like? We are actually going to be figuring that out. So we just awarded the grant last week. So I, I think that they just need like a hot second to, to get to catch their breath. But I do know that one of the things that was in um, the RFP was uh, to, to uh, do a, string, a spring planting season. Um, and so it's going to be small. I just want to be very clear. We knew that if they were just finding out in March, we could not overdo it <laughs> um, in, in the spring planting season, especially since we're now feeling like, unfortunately, June is starting to get a little late given how, how many heat waves we've already started having 
um, in June. Um, and so our spring planting season may be slightly curtailed um, to what it has been in the past, um, given those, those heat changes. But um, I will make sure that we set that up. We actually have a meeting to, to meet with Audubon think next week to begin thinking that through. And then what I will make sure that we do is we actually share whatever comes out of that. And then I think it would be great to have an engagement with um, the council and, and counselors commit to maybe trying to recruit two groups per, you know, counselor into that. That would be super, super, super helpful, especially um, if there are groups that you know of that are, uh, have not been well represented in this conversation to date, that would be amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly thinking, you know, about the, the heat island environmental justice neighborhoods in my district. Obviously, my district has the strongest tree canopy and yes. one of the strongest <laughs> tree canopies. Um, but Eggleston Square is very much a heat island. We are, you know, in the process of kind of like designing a redesign of Eggleston Square and wanting to get some of the Eggleston Square neighbors and organizations that represent that neighborhood really a part of the Tree Alliance where, you know, we have a bunch of people from Jamaica Plain, from West Roxbury, from the other areas of my district who are really involved in this. Uh, and so mm -hmm. thinking about the neighborhoods where the neighborhoods that are most impacted, that whose voice is not as represented in that process. Uh, so well, we'd love to help because you know we're talking to Eggleston about the Peace Garden. So a, if there's yeah. a way to bring those two things together, that would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And so whenever you have clarity about what membership and joining looks like, please send it my way so that we can kind of have a conversation around the Eggleston Square redesign, trees, tree alliance, that kind of green space. How do we mitigate that heat island there? Um, in the urban forestry plan, you set a goal of having 35% tree canopy coverage by 2030. Is that correct? Is that the number? I, I see Max. Max, give correct us. Give me the give me the actual number. <laughs> we did not. Sorry, my voice is still going to crack. No, don't worry about it. Um, we did not set a tree canopy goal in our urban forest plan that we do not have a goal of a canopy cover. Our goal is to have an equitable canopy throughout the entire city. Got it. So there is not a 35% goal. No. And Liza, if you want to lead into that more. And so this is, I think this speaks back to the question that Councilor Louis-Jean um, raised, which is that our first goal, as, it, as you saw, equity first, is actually leaning in on the hardest to serve neighborhoods in some instances because of the historical decisions that have been made and getting them up to a bare minimum viable standard, right? Because um, the reality is both in Eastie and in Chinatown, in parts of Alston, like it's gonna, it, it's gonna be challenging. Um, and many other communities have just decided to set a number and so then they just go out and do trees. But the often what that means is the communities that have been poorly served before continue mm -hmm. to be poorly served because they're so hard. Um, and so I'll, I'll say this publicly and as many mm -hmm. places, we are starting with the hard stuff first because it's the right, right thing to do. Um, so what part of what it is, is as we work with the Alliance, but also with a lot of groups to figure out how do we get canopy in the places where it hasn't been, that is our first goal. Um, and, and we know that it means it's gonna probably be a little bit slower because it's harder. Mm -hmm. But if we had made these investments in these communities before, we wouldn't be in this place. And so we need to start by repairing that harm. Yeah, so your clarification has answered my question because that was, that was, that was gonna be my question. I'm like, how there are places who have less than 20% coverage. How are you, is this by neighborhood? Is it for the entire city? And so your clarification, has answered yep. my question around equity because I'm just like, where, how are you targeting um, yeah. this tree canopy growth? And so thank you for that. And that's Max, the, you can go ahead. That's the behind not setting a, a number of that 35% yeah. or any percentage was so that we could focus on neighborhoods that are, that may have 10%, 9%, 7%, right? Mm -hmm. Is to get that equal, that equal number right now. Okay, thank you. And so, and my last question is really about tree removal. I know Chief White Hammond, you've mentioned, we've talked about Chinatown a little bit, but just thinking about in other places in the city where it's really difficult to plant trees, uh, but also thinking about tree removal when it comes, the sidewalks, basically. I, I wanna talk about the sidewalks. Is when, when trees are damaging sidewalks, is tree remo is removing the tree kind of like the last ditch effort? What are the other things that are considered before deciding 
to remove a tree because of damage. And I'm, I'm asking because I know that in places like DC, they use like flexible pavement material around trees. And so is there anything that we can do before to prevent the damage and is removing the tree kind of like the last ditch effort after we've seen some sidewalk damage? It is, yeah. So removing the tree is the literal last ditch effort. Um, and in order to remove a tree, we'd have to hold a public hearing if the tree is alive and healthy. So even when it comes to a damaged sidewalk, uh, according to the state law that we currently have on, on in the books, a uh, uh, damaged sidewalk is not a reason for removing a tree. You, that is not a reason that I can go out and remove a tree that, to this day. Uh, so if public works want to reconstruct a roadway, they would still have to go and hold a public tree hearing. Uh, they did for Ruggles Street. There were certain uh, areas of Ruggles Street where uh, the sidewalks were literally only 18 inches wide. Uh, and they wanted to uh, make them compliant. Uh, so they uh, came before a tree hearing and members of the public also showed up, many of them. Uh, and we had a thoughtful discussion as to which trees could be removed and which trees should be saved uh, mm -hmm. and how we could work around that. And so flexible paving, porous paving was worked into that equation, larger tree pits. Uh, they even bumped out the, the curbing on Ruggles Street, um, as you might know or may not know. Uh, the curbing was moved six feet in some areas to allow for the uh, accessible sidewalk. Um, so yes, the last thing that we ever do is remove the tree for a sidewalk hindrance. Um, there are many things that can happen uh, before removing the tree is ever an option. Do you preemptively use flexible pavement? Uh, so that, that is something that uh, I would love that to be a preemptive uh, solution. Um, currently, asphalt is the uh, flexible solution right now that Public Works uses. It might not be the prettiest option out there, um, but it uh, lasts a lot longer, of course, than concrete uh, and is a lot less intrusive. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Kate England, uh, and as you may know, the new director of uh, uh, Green Surfaces. <laughs> yep, she is uh, a, a, a huge proponent of the flexi pave and porous paving uh, materials. And so hopefully uh, with her involved now in the city that we will be able to, you know, work hand in hand with her to use that material a lot more going forward um, because it does, you know, a, a lengthen the life of a sidewalk as well as allow for a tree to be a lot uh, more healthy and to grow to a lot larger size without, uh, you know, destroying a sidewalk. Um, so yeah, we, it is definitely an option we are gonna be using a lot more going forward. Okay, thank you so much, Max, for the clarification and the, and, and the answer to the questions. That is all that I have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I see uh, Councillor Mejia, and then I'll ask my, my last question. And then I have a question that I'm gonna ask on behalf of Councillor Braden, but Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a quick follow-up, and I'm just curious about the makeup of the folks who are going to be on uh, the committee, the advisory council. You know, uh, I'm still trying to, I don't know the exact name of it, but whatever it's going to be, um, I'm curious as to if you could just share with me the makeup of folks. Are we looking at having young people be a part of, uh, to have a seat at the table? Or, and if you already talked about those things, please apologize. You know, I accept my apologies for not uh, hearing that. Um, and I'm also curious about uh, language interpretation and translation and engagement for uh, folks who, whose English you know, English is not their first language in, in terms of accessibility. You know, what does that look like in terms of making sure that we have representation from diverse perspectives and experiences? Can you just talk to me a little bit about that? Sure, Councilor Mejia. I can read you the exact language we wrote, which is BPRD shall convene an advisory committee to address issues such as policies and recommendations for forestry protection and expansion, public education and outreach. The department shall invite participation from, from residents from historically marginalized or under canopied neighborhoods and from residents between the ages of 14 and 17. So uh, we, we added that, that in um, because we know that there are unique needs when we include young people in the process and we wanna make sure that that committee is set up in such a way that young people can be um, part of the conversation. Uh, but I'll just be transparent, but we will have, it will be, you know, from across the city, but it will be mostly from the, the neighborhoods where we're doing the most work to begin with, um, because that's where a lot of the energy will be going. And so we need the most input and direction from the communities um, that have 
are under canopy at this point. No, I, I, and I and I appreciate that. And, you know, having worked in the youth development space, I just would like to add and uplift and, and advocate um, that when we're looking at the recruitment, it's usually the, the, the young people who who are highly engaged already. But that if there's an opportunity to create uh, some space for those who who may not be well versed or, you know, or who, who, who this could be a really great educational opportunity for them, you know, so I just think that. I, I I always find that the best engagement is when we are super intentional about creating space for those who are not so engaged. Mm -hmm. And so the recruitment process, I'm hoping, will um, not just be diverse in age, but also in, in experience with this, in this world, if you will. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense, but I just want to offer that as something to consider. Um, as you as you continue to go through this process, and then I guess um, th that was basically it. I just wanted to hear a little bit about your engagement uh, process and 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 outreach efforts for harder to reach youth and also uh, those who have least uh, been engaged in these sort of conversations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Mejia. So I'm going to now ask my my two questions now that my internet straightened out, and then uh, the question from Councilor Brayden. Then we'll go to uh, any closings if you have them, uh, Chief Reverend. But then also community comment. We have a number of folks who've been very patient, so we'll go to them, and uh, I'll give them each three minutes. Uh, so one question I have is one of the things that often happens uh, is that we'll have development where they'll say we're cutting six trees, but don't worry, we'll plant ten or we'll plant exactly the same number. Obviously, there's a difference between a fully mature tree and, and a sapling. But my question is, because it's something I'd like to tie into this, can we require that because so many trees die due to lack of care in that seven year period, can we require when we make these requirements of developers that they plant this or they do this, is there a way for us to make it so that this ordinance or some other mechanism that we actually require the tree to be fully healthy within a certain, certain period of time, otherwise they have to replant that tree. And then, so if they cut six trees and they're saying we're gonna give you 10 and then they don't take care of them, so really only three of them make it to maturity, is there a way to sort of build into that from a legal perspective or in this tree ordinance that you actually have to make sure that that tree reaches maturity or that you're doing your very best to make sure that tree reaches maturity? Go, Max, if you wanna, I mean, we have some provisions that we make. Maybe we could put those on them. But Max, did you have a, a, some specific ideas? Yeah. So I was just going to say what you were going to say, Chief, is that we currently require two years um, as a warranty. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the industry standard right now is two years after the date of planting um, that the tree still has to be alive and healthy. Um, and that is, you know, the, the common industry standard. So I think if you went with that, you would be within the law and no one could really argue against that. Um, so yes. Quick question. I, I, Quick question for you. Is the two years selected randomly or is there a difference in say percentage of trees that survive after that two year period? Does it, is there like a noticeable drop in terms of after two years, if a tree has survived two years, then there's a 90 or eight. Like, is there a percentage of success that we get for that tree moving forward if it makes it past that two years or is it two years sort of just picked randomly? Two years yeah. is, is the acceptable industry standard. So if your tree gets to two years, like if you have a healthy tree for those two years, then there is a highly like high likelihood that the tree will survive going forward as long as there is continued maintenance. Right. So, so we, at, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to just say, I would say the two years is the industry standard here, but in Canada and Europe, they're pushing past that between three and five years and a number of different spaces where I've been able to talk to people. But at, to Max's point, honestly, five years ago, Max, you, it, you told me one year was the industry standard and people were going with that, which might be why we were losing a lot of our trees because it was one year and, and two was better. If we could get to three, we every year that you add increases the likelihood that that tree is, it just means that somebody's gonna monitor it because they know it's gonna cost them something if it if it dies. And I, I, you know, so I think that um, 
I think, but my, my belief is that currently on private development, there's nothing. So I think, to be honest with you, if we were to even codify and say, you have to ha plant your trees with a two year warranty and or demonstrate a two year, you know, that you have a landscaping company or something like that would be an improvement on what we have right now. There is also the reality that climate change is changing the conditions of what we're experiencing. We did not used to have heat waves in May. And now for two years, we've had our first heat wave in May. Once in the, once one time, even before Memorial Day. So, so there are, I, I think, I would say both, if we got two years in there, it is the industry standard and it would be better than what we have right now. At the same time, if I had my druthers and my hope is that even we as the Parks Department might have the resources to be able to move to three years, every year you add costs more because what you're paying for is to somebody to come out with a watering truck to take care of it and to look at it and put eyes on it. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do, I think we all have to, to figure it out, but I, I do think some requirement or attention to the fact that it's not just throwing a tree in the ground and crossing your fingers that we would want more, more than that. Yep. Any attention we can pay to that would, would move us a, ahead of where we are right now. So where I they think can even show them to you on a piece of paper and it never even actually gets planted. Like that's where we are right now, right? I would like so, us to get past that, yeah. And so I think we can codify that. That sounds like something that we might want to move towards codifying, just making sure that there's an understanding because I, I, I often hear, we're, yeah, we're cutting those trees down, but we're going to double the amount of trees or we're going to match that amount of trees. And it doesn't really matter if those trees don't make it to maturity. So making sure that that is actually a thing uh, is important. A, a last question for me is around land, land acquisition, which is a tool that I know the city has. Uh, we have a limited amount of funds for land acquisition. I saw, is it possible to get the map back up there for tree canopy? protection. So I think I, so what I have understood from folks who have talked to me about, you know, when I've talked to Councilor Anderson, or I talked to Councilor Lauer, or I talked to other Councilor Coletta about different districts. There we go. I happen to represent that nice, lovely green area at the bottom of that map. When you are focusing on land acquisition, are you, is there a priority system around you know, for instance, that area around Chinatown, that area in Charlestown, like when you are prioritizing those dollars, are you prioritizing protections where there aren't many at all? Or are you trying to sort of preserve where there's the most? And if, they, if it's a push and a pull, is it the preservation of places where it's like where the light, light green is? Is that where the focus is? Because I think we have a situation here where, you know, if you look at the other side all the way on the, so it's kind of like juxtaposed. You have one side, one side. If you look at it, you'll see that a lot of the cut, like a lot of the red is happening where it's still dark green. But if you look at like the new plantings, they're happening where it's not even green yet. Like if you look at the, at the final one, right? And so if you're doing preservation or prioritizing the preservation of land through that budget, can you just walk me through sort of what what the focus is? Is it on sort of trying to maintain or create new spaces for trees in places like up north on that map? Is that essentially the idea? Yeah, so I think, um, and and Liza actually, we released our parcel prioritization plan, which we have to do for the state, I believe it's every five years. And I actually think, you know, we'll send that to you because, and, and to all the counselors and people can, can, can I think that'll be look helpful at that it, because yeah. it really, um, I think that plan does the best job of helping people to understand where we're looking at acquiring space. Um, and we're, we're also in a conversation right now, again, with the BPDA and the, um, at the direction of the mayor of really looking at what is our open space plan. Um, both what do we want to require of private developers when they're acquiring land and what do we want to acquire ourselves? Um, because I do think, uh, so both, yes, we are paying attention to where there's no, um, 
open space. And so this, this is actually just giving you tree canopy data, but there's also another picture. It's not entirely different, but that tells you where our actual open space is currently. And we're looking at where do we not have open space and where do we need to increase that? So yes, Chinatown is an example. It's just, we can all, anybody who's been there, you can see that we don't have a lot of, a lot of park space. So that's, that is an example of place that we're doing. So we are being driven again by this equity conversation, again, by this question of heat. Um, and we are looking to some extent at density. So we, we have an amount of, of um, open space we want per capita because there's some places, for instance, as an example, uh, in West Roxbury, where many, many, many people have single family homes, which means that a lot of times people have backyards. And so they have access to doesn't mean that they wouldn't want to go to a park, but they have access to green space. And then you have a place like Chinatown, or even, quite frankly, the seaport, where most of it is, is really dense apartment buildings. And so that there's no backyard for people to go to. And so we really have to pay attention, not just to the amount of open space that's in every neighborhood, but how dense the neighborhood is, because a denser neighborhood should have more open space because it's the only natural space that people have access to. So that wasn't always historically the case, which means that we've got a lot of repair work to do um, in many different neighborhoods, even including places like the seaport, as an example, where they just built a lot of stuff and there's not a lot of green space for the people um, that live there. So we're really we're looking at both, where do we acquire land? The second thing that we're looking at is, um, and an ex example that we've uh, moved forward recently on A Street in a related Beale project, where um, they are building higher and the agreement has been that they will, as part of that, build a public park on their land um, to match the fact that they're gonna bring in lots of new people to that area, to an area that has, that was previously industrial and so therefore has almost no park land. Um, and so they will, as part of that development pro project, build the park, give it to us and pay for the maintenance. Those are the kinds of things that we need to be looking at because some people are doing really well in this building boom and we need to make sure um, that they are helping us to provide uh, resources. Um, so there's both acquisition is one piece of it, but there's also this conversation about how we change the development process to make sure that um, large developments, your Dorchester-based cities, you're like, there's a number of places that are out there that are huge size developments. And we're saying, if you're gonna bring in all those new people, you need to help support additional public open space for the people living in those apartments so that they have a place to go um, because most of them are building high rises that don't have backyards. And so I guess one question just for understanding this map so people don't run crazy with this. I just want to make this part clear because it would be helpful to me. In terms of where the most canopy loss is, right, I think there's a the difference between equality and equity, right? Mm -hmm where they're cutting trees. So does this neighborhood sort of break down, which I think you might be sending to, to uh, Councillor uh, uh, Tanya Fernandez-Anderson, if there's, so a 10% reduction in one neighborhood of trees and a 10% reduction in a neighborhood, another neighborhood with trees can be a completely different 10%, if you get what I'm saying. Yep. It can actually be yep. the difference between you know, we had 10 trees and now we have single digit trees and we have this many trees and we have that. Is this reflective of, because you did a street tree count, obviously this includes, I think, private trees too, um, to some extent. In terms of the tree canopy, is it possible mm -hmm. for us to know not just the percentages, but like how many trees we're actually talking about for like these areas? Because if you cut a certain amount of trees in Roxbury where there's a, a deficit or in, uh, Charlestown or East Boston, where there's a deficit, it might be a smaller percentage, but it's a it's a bigger impact, if that makes sense. And so I don't know <laughs> if it's reflective of that. Yeah. So I, I'll hand that to Liza. One thing I do know is that a lot of the canopy numbers are based on satellite data, where we're, yep. we're looking at density Google of trees. Google Maps, for instance. Uh, a little bit more advanced than that, but, but basically. Um, and so I'm not sure that we would have the numbers because what we're doing is looking at a mass of trees and then asking what, how small did that mass get? Does that make sense? Yes. 
So, but I, I don't know, Liza, are we able to provide any additional, is there any way for us to extrapolate those numbers? I'm not sure that there is. Yeah. I'm not sure there is either. Certainly for street trees, we have numbers because we did an inventory, a, you know, tree by tree inventory, but for general tree coverage across all property types, I'm not sure that we do, but we have the, this sense of change. I pulled up this map because one of the um, indicators is the areas with low canopy coverage already. So areas that already have 10% or less canopy coverage, um, which, gets at the point of these are the places where it's already low, where increase, you know, increasing loss is going to be all the more detrimental and where gains could be all the more positively impactful. Um, so this priority zone map is something that not just shows where we need to be prioritizing plantings, but also where protecting trees that are already there um, is essential. Right? It's, it goes both ways. It's not just about planting, it's about planting and protection. And you can see that the majority of the city has some degree of these indicators. Um, in most cases, at least two of these indicators. So there's- And so just, just if I can cut in there. So it would seem, just if I'm reading this map correctly, that Councillor Lara's district, which would be sort of where all that white and green is, uh, where West Roxbury and Jamaica Plain is, and then my district where you can see the Stony Brook Reservations impact right there. Those look like, even though we do have indicator of priority zones, it looks like the higher priority zones are really District 7, uh, which is Roxbury, uh, the downtown area. It looks like Alston Brighton, East Boston, Charlestown, um, a significant portion of Dorchester. Is that an accurate read of this map? Is that those are essentially the priority zones? So looking at this map, it would look like districts five and district six are sort of low, the lowest on the priority zone based on just sort of reading where the red hotspots are on this. Is that an accurate read? Yes. All right. That's helpful um, to know. And then I, I will ask as a final question before I go to community, Liz Braden's question, which was about cooperation with other agencies. Uh, she says that the MBTA along the commuter app corridor, as an example, uh, road work contractors and neighboring municipalities seem to do a better job protecting street trees with boards and screening. And Alston is an environmental justice community and has significant heat island effect. Are we targeting that area? Which looking at this map, it looks like the answer is yes. So I think the second part of that question is just, uh, how are we working with things like the MBTA, which I can tell you in my district, it's been incredibly difficult to work with the MBTA. So I'm assuming the city is having similar stories. So we, I'll just say this. It, we are hopeful that there are leadership changes at the state that will change the dynamics. The historical dynamics are challenging. Um, so we're, we're not closed. We believe that to really address tree canopy, we need to be working with the MBTA and DCR and Massport and our historical experience is not amazing in that part. <laughs> How diplomatically nice of saying it's it's awful, because I, I, in my district, it's awful. So I appreciate the diplomacy, the diplomacy there. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna go to community uh, comment. Uh, I think everybody who signed up, except I think one or two are here. Um, and so we are going to make you a panelist. Uh, please raise your hand if you have signed up for public testimony so that we can get to you quickly and know that you're ready. Um, we're going to make you a panelist. You will then speak. I'm going to give you all three minutes. Uh, if you are representing an organization, please, please state that. Uh, if you are uh, able to tell us what neighborhood in the city that you are representing as a resident, that would be great as well. Uh, and so we will now go through that list uh, and then set, uh, central staff, if you can help me make sure folks are, are brought up. Uh, we're going to try and do it by order of people who signed up. So there, there is a method to this. It's what order you signed up in. We'll get you up here quicker. Uh, and so uh, I know Lisa Beatman is first. I'm not sure if she's uh, on yet. So we can go to David uh, Mishulam the executive director and co-founder of Speak for the Trees. Thank you, uh, Councillor Arroyo, and thank you everyone today for your comments and your questions. My name is David Meshulam, uh, executive director here at Speak for the Trees. I know 
most everyone here, um, except for Todd Mister. So welcome, Todd. Uh, we're really excited to have a director of urban forestry, and I want to thank the leadership that uh, Commissioner Woods and Chief uh, Hammond have shown in developing this position on the plan. Um, I prepared comments focused more on the um, on the proposed ordinance itself, but I did have some thoughts that um, emerged while people were talking, and I just want to throw them out there. Um, so for those of you who don't know about our organization, we uh, work at the community level to engage residents in uh, caring for trees and learning about trees and planting trees. Um, and we've been around for about five years um, and we're super excited for the Alliance and for the increased capacity that the city is showing. Um, and I think one of the things that we're really excited for is also to have a director of urban forestry where we can start sharing information and data. So we have a lot of great programs we're running. Um, there's a lot of great data and information the city has. And a lot of the conversations that came out earlier in this morning focused on, on data and, and, and GIS mapping. So we hope that we can, I know that Mariama and I, uh, Chief Mariama and I have spoken about a tree adoption platform that we've developed, um, thinking about how we could really lean in on that and lift that up. Um, so I'm just going to run through real quick my my brief comments about the um, the ordinance itself, because for the past couple of months, I've been working closely with or there's been a coalition of folks uh, working very closely to sort of unpack the ordinance. Um, and we think it's an exciting opportunity to do this uh, ordinance. Um, and I just wanted to quote a little bit from the Department of Conservation and Recreation because it's developed a review of tree ordinances across the state. And it recommends that the process begin, quote, with some soul searching and information gathering. What are the goals of the community? What are the needs? What are the issues that a tree ordinance should clarify? What resources does the community currently have? And I think with the urban forest plan, a lot of that has been done. But as Boston embarks on this process, it is critical that community voices continue to be front and center in the process. So we've been meeting a group of residents and advocates through a coalition called the Environmental Health as Wealth Advocacy Coalition. Uh, we've been meeting regularly to analyze the proposed ordinance. And I believe we sent to you last week our shared goals and principles statement. Yeah, you got that, as well as suggested edits to the proposed ordinance. We hope that the specifics of these documents shape the content of the ordinance, but more importantly, we appeal to you that community members' voices, concerns, and hopes be more centrally involved in next steps, especially in the upcoming working sessions that begin in April. So for the remainder of my time, and I don't know how much time uh, I have, Councilor Arroyo. I extended it a minute because I knew you were, you were saying you had other thoughts from this that I want to make sure I gave you time to speak on. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just speak about some of the concerns uh, and suggestions that the, that the coalition had. First, there was a lot of concern raised about the piecemeal and bifurcated approach. Uh, there was a uh, worry that this would lead to an incomplete and fractured ordinance uh, where so small successes would, would be seen as complete successes and would stop future progress. Uh, second, uh, there was strong suggestions that tree protection ordinance is just one part of what should be a larger effort, and I heard this today, uh, to be aligned with other city zoning and development processes uh, tied to permitting, especially as it relates to the BPDA. So that must include an assessment of all the trees on property and a pre pre preservation plan before permits are issued. In other words, this ordinance should not be the only tool used to protect trees. It should be seen just as one piece of a larger puzzle. And in addition, the tree fund, we believe, needs to be better defined to include activities such as education, planting on private property, and other maintenance costs associated with public trees. Uh, there might also be opportunities, we believe, to provide stipends for individuals to sit on the Urban Forest Committee, or whatever the name of the committee is, as a way to ensure equitable community representation. Uh, I will submit the rest of my comments uh, to the secretary and to the committee members. I wanted to just thank everyone for this. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation um, and, and a, a stronger and more equitable forest for future generations. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your taking the time to be. Uh, Celeste Walker. 
I, and just a reminder to folks, because I've been told some of our panelists are literally, so you have to be invited to be a panelist to speak. So some folks are being invited to speak and not accepting the move over to panelists, which is making it hard for us to go in order. And so uh, Celeste, uh, the floor is yours, but if you are being invited to be a panelist and you're still in the attendees, please, please accept that so that we can make sure that you are heard as well. Celeste, the floor is yours. Thank you for your patience. Oh, thank you. And um, thank you, Councillor Arroyo and Breeden and Lara for sponsoring this and to the Boston Parks and Recreation Department for all your hard work. And um, there, you just have an excellent staff. Um, I've thrown out most of my comments since a lot of it was sort of preaching to the choir about the need for an ordinance. So I want to add that I'm part of the group um, Environmental Health is Wealth, which David referenced. And I agree that we need to work on both the hard and the, well, the easy and the hard parts of an ordinance all at once, because I fear that if we don't, the hard parts will never get done. And we as a group, and I think most of the people on this call are willing to help and reach out to neighborhood groups because that's what we do and we know. And I think if we all sit around and have a seat at the table, and that includes all the interests and um, tree advocates, neighborhood groups, um, people, developers, and um, Boston City Departments, I think we can hash this out and we can come to a ordinance that people can live with and get it all done by the end of the year. But I think we really need to prioritize it and, and get it done and do both at the same time. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Celeste. And I just want to be clear, everybody has my commitment. This is getting done this year. So we will get this through both parts if it's bifurcated this year. Uh, that is my commitment. So that, that will happen. Um, I want to go to, and again, I'm calling folks in order of signing up, uh, Margaret uh, Pocorny. Is Margaret already up here? While you bring her in, uh, I see Joanna, ha Joanna Haynes is here, or Hines rather, Joanna Hines, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you all so much for putting this together. Um, I'm excited to hear that that you're expecting this to be enacted by the end of the year. And I'm also very encouraged um, to hear that, you know, that public land will be including BHA parcels, because a lot of people, including myself, were under the impression during some of these redevelopment meetings in Charlestown anyway, that the BHA owned the land. And it's, of course, Boston land. And that's been made clear to many of us, but it wasn't initially. So. As an example of public land with trees, Charleston makes a good one. I mean, the Bunker Hill housing development is 27 acres, but only nine of those acres have buildings on them, which means almost 20 acres of public land in Charlestown have nearly 400 trees, all of which are about 80 years old. The city um, should protect these trees and I really hope that if the plan is to have this ordinance enacted by the end of the year, an ordinance that will protect trees on public land, including those trees on the land that BHA manages, that you will implement a moratorium on the removal of these trees until the ordinance is enacted. It really doesn't make any sense to say, we're taking this seriously, we're gonna do it, BHA trees are included, but we're gonna let them chop them down now, even though we hope to have this done in six months. There's something you can do here. Put a pause on the removal of these Charlestown, of these Boston trees. They sit on public land. The Parks Department wrote a letter in 2020 asking for an inventory after the development process had been in full throttle for a year. That inventory was actually made public a month before the Parks Department even thought to ask for it. And I have the letter. But what I also have, and I'm happy to provide, is documentation from Bartlett Trees that inventories every single tree by species, age, health, DBH, 
so that you don't have to go through that hoop. We've got the data, you can see where they are and save them. This development project hasn't even started. It's an, it, the, the fact that the people that live there had to choose between housing and trees was a false choice from the start, but there's still something that can be done. So that's my first thing I'd like to say. The question I have though, as it came up today, was about the trust fund that is managed by the parks department. I think it was Ryan Wood who said there's a trust fund um, that gets money, $550 per uh, inch caliber um, of tree removals in the city. And then that money is put toward projects around the city. I'm curious, the, the Bartlett tree inventory for Charlestown showed $1.5 million in tree asset. Has the city collected any money on this so far? And if so, where is that money going? Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Uh, we next have Margaret. I see that you are now on if you're able to go. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted now? Yes, um, you're unmuted. We can hear you. I really appreciate the fact that you say this is going to be done by the end of this year. I feel like I've been waiting 30 years for this to be addressed. And so this is this hearing and some of the insights and some of the new issues that have been raised, I think are really quite stunning. And you have a lot of people in the community who are behind you and willing to put a lot of time into this. There are a couple of things that were raised in the comments that I just want to just want to say again, uh, and I think that um, Councillor Flynn's mention of gas leaks and the relation of tree death to gas leaks is important. That's just another agency to deal with in addressing the health of the urban canopy. The other thing that Max mentioned was identifying places where trees could be planted, even in neighborhoods where there is a significant canopy. Um, that is something that a group of volunteers could easily do if they were given sort of parameters like what is the distance um, between trees that are required by the city so that we could do an inventory of available locations. And that, that's something certainly we could do in Back Bay, which is the neighborhood that I represent. And the other is using a lot of these park advocacy groups who have been around for a long time, like the Friends of the Public Garden, who are over 50 years old, Garden Club of the Back Bay, which is over 50 years old, which would like to share our experience and our expertise with parks groups in other parts of the city that don't have that kind of um, experience. How would that be structured? Maybe this tree, um, the new tree committee can add that in as one of the possible approaches because it would spread the expertise, might even end up sp spreading some money um, to other neighborhoods that are more, more needy. But I'm thrilled that this is happening and thanks to all the counselors um, who are promoting this and let's hope it's done by December. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so now it's uh, Mr. Masterson. I see you're here. Yes, thank you very much, counselor. Um, I guess I'd like to take a, I'm Bill Masterson from Tree Eastie, by the way, um, step back and, and celebrate a little bit this moment, because if you dial back a couple of years ago, we probably as a group would not be spending, the city council wouldn't be spending three over three and a half hours um, talking about this ordinance and the progress that we've made in the past, that you've made in the past two years has been incredible. Um, even back a year uh, probably would not have taken as much time out of your agenda to be able to talk about such an important topic. So Tree EC has been successful over the past um, two years in for a couple of reasons. One, our all volunteer network. So we are foot feet on the ground and I would encourage the um, city council to take the model that we've developed in East Boston and that Speak for the Trees has developed across the city of Boston to do as much um, outreach into the community to allow us to be able to help you find your way into these neighborhoods. Um, we are a volunteer, all volunteer based group. We have resources um, that complement what the city is trying to do and we work very closely with Commissioner Woods, uh, with Max and Liza as well to be able to align where trees should go in East Boston. With um, the partnership that we have with Max, we've been able to plant over 160 trees in East Boston. Um, a lot of them have been street trees and empty tree pits that were sitting empty for a number of years. 
Um, we've raised funds um, to be able to plant the trees in those pits, and we do have grant money that is available. So we supplement, I think, the city's budget to allow um, more trees to be planted in this environmental justice community. We've got a group of folks that are out now tagging trees with these adopt a tree tags, the um, tags that, that have been developed to put on any new city planted tree as well as tree Easty tree. There are about 90 people that have adopted trees in East Boston, again, to be able to supplement the city's efforts. So I love the direction that the urban master plan is taking with um, Jeep Reverend looking at sort of bite-sized pieces because it is an overwhelming task and it's gonna be a lot of work for a lot of people. But if you could use or um, choose to use Tree Easty as an incubator for some of those ideas, we are working with developers right now to um, get them to plant more trees as part of their plans, both on their sites as well as in uh, on the streets. Uh, we're also working to raise additional funds and um, provide grant monies to plant more trees. Um, we've got a group that's working on a bilingual tree education benefit brochure that's going into the communities. Um, it's Spanish speaking, uh, heavily Spanish speaking community, but a bilingual Spanish and English brochure that's gonna talk to the residents about uh, the benefits of trees and why they should take care of trees, adopt trees, advocate for a tree, tree to be planted in front of their home. I love the fact that the um, Chief Reverend is working across the other departments. I would love to be able to plant more trees on Boston public school property because most of those school yards are all asphalt, but we've been sort of a limited in terms of how involved we can be there. Um, so breaking those down those barriers will also be able to help us make a greener and cleaner East Boston. Thank you very much for the passion uh, and very impressed with the level of um, intelligence and um, thoughtfulness that the city council has put um, behind this led by Councilor Coletta, who uh, not only walks the walk, talks the talk, but walks the walk. She shows up at our volunteer events with a shovel and she's planted trees in East Boston. So we're very grateful for her uh, involvement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masterson, for your work out there and for the uh, the flag on the schools. That is something that I think we absolutely should figure out how to how to do. I went to school, for instance, with the Sarah Greenwood, and they have that massive asphalt in the back there that's like a parking lot size, but doesn't have any trees or sort of places to play. And we have Trinity School, which is closer to my district, which is a private school that had a similar situation, and they took half of that parking lot and they made it into a park, and it's really nice. Um, and so if we can do those kinds of things with BPS, I think that's that's smart. Um, so thank you for that flag. Um, Sarah Freeman. Council, I, I've got to run to my 1.30, but I yep. will, um, but uh, this is all Commissioner recorded. Woods this is staying recorded. on and he and I will connect afterward just to make sure that I, I capture any sentiment that I missed. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Ms. Freeman, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I will save time. This has been a long, long hearing, so I submitted an email that I won't um, read excerpts from, but I will say I echo the previous speakers and really appreciate the counselor's interest and appreciate the hearing. and. Um, as Margaret said, it feels like we've been waiting a long, long time for this, so i um, very excited. Uh, and meanwhile, while we've been waiting, a lot of trees have come down. So my new info I can send in a follow-up email. Um, health institutions, I think it was Reverend Mariama who's talked about reaching out to them, reminded me that Louisville, Kentucky has a partnership with health institutions, um, just recognizing the, the value of trees and trying to research, like to look more into it. Um, I have a six and a half minute video link that I'll share. It's very informative. One thing that caught my attention is that they became alarmed when their canopy, they were losing, I think, 54,000 trees a year, and their canopy had dropped to 37%. And so it was kind of a dose of humble pie for me that, uh, that they became 
mobilized when they realized they were down to 37. So in our uh, outreach, especially on uh, private land with the developers, I'd like to see us do more in the way of us, meaning the city, in the way of education and communication so that we're preventing harm rather than thinking in terms of mitigation. And I'll give you one example. In my uh, participation with the Friends of Melnia Cass Boulevard, there was a developer who came to talk to the group. And one of the participants said, ask the guy, who I won't name, um, that didn't it ever occur to you that the rest neighbors might care about this tree? And the answer was, well, the city, it wasn't on the city's priority list. And so just, that was also a splash of, of cold water. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you again and look forward to supporting however I can. Oh, I forgot to say I'm from JP. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, and live on the Arbor Way, which Arbor means tree. So. It's kind of a natural. Thank yeah, you. it's a good fit. Thank you. Uh, if we can go to uh, John, John Michelle. Yes, thank you, Councillor Arroyo. Thank you for putting forward this ordinance. Thank you, Councillors Lara and Reardon. Um, I, I join with my fellow advocates. This has been a terrific discussion. Uh, good for us that we are advancing in this way. I am a um, three and a half year, three and a half decade resident of Hyde Park. Uh, I want to make a quick personal statement, which is as a resident of Hyde Park, which appears on the map uh, to be overly endowed or, or blessed with tree canopy. You know, the, the tree canopy here in Hyde Park benefits the whole city, the whole region. Um, I think we, I, I get a little nervous um, when we talk about uh, some, some areas uh, being more subject to tree removal and not taking that seriously. But today I want to uh, quickly enter into the record uh, statement on behalf of the Crane Ledge Woods Coalition. Um, our coalition is a 50 plus member volunteer organization advocating for full conservation of the Crane Ledge Woods, which is a 24 acre urban woodland bar bordering Hyde Park, Mattapan and Roslindale. We see the, this tree protection ordinance as one of the priority recommendations included in the urban forest plan. And it should be developed through a widely inclusive process benefiting from the knowledge of all stakeholders and meaningfully including their concerns and priorities. We all know that urban tree canopy provides incredible essential benefits to Boston residents' health and well-being. We urge that the final ordinance reflect the input from residents and from environmental specialists with expertise in this area. Our goals as a coalition uh, agree with the recommendations for stronger protections than in the current draft ordinance. And we fully black back the community-based groups co-led by Speak for the Trees and the Environmental Health and Wealth Coalition. We stand in full support of our neighbors across Boston working to address priority concerns around climate change, environmental justice, and the advancement of equitable, sustainable development, focusing on affordable housing as at walkable locations near public transit hubs. We don't have to cut down woodlands to achieve these goals. Reasonable protections of trees on private property is a key element of an effective tree ordinance. And we anticipate open constructive dialogue on how best to accomplish this. <clears throat> and then I was really glad to hear from you, Councillor Arroyo, that the goal is to get it done, whether bifurcated or not this year. That's really important. The Crane Ledge Woods Coalition looks forward to an ordinance that recognizes the irreplaceable value of urban woodlands like Crane Ledge Woods and for measures both in this ordinance and through other city initiatives for protection and conservation of priority urban woodland and coastal sites. This would include a proactive fair land acquisition program 
with a focus on environmental justice neighborhoods. So thank you all uh, for hearing me today on behalf of the coalition. Thank you, John. You, you hit exactly three minutes. So that was perfect. Thank you. Uh, if we can go to uh, Rick Yoder, and then I'm going to go to Lisa Beatman, and then I'll go to Karen. Uh, so, uh, Rick, the floor is yours, then Lisa, uh, then Karen. Yes, uh, thank you, Councilor Royal, for this hearing. And I wanted to also thank uh, Chief Mary uh, White Hammond uh, for her attention to details of all this prob these problems we have on the maintaining our tree uh, canopy. I'm trying to run through four uh, points. Uh, well, first up on my uh, co-chair of the Mount Hope Canterbury Neighborhood Association, neighborhood um, right along American Legion Highway at East General Rosendale, also a member of the Crane Ledge Coalition. Uh, one point about um, my park is referred to a lot as having lots of trees. And I was, I was, other people sort of made this point is that, uh, but, but specifically, if you live near Stony Brook Reservation, you, you have a lot of trees around. That, that is a lot of trees there. You go to other parts of Hyde Park and it's, it's not so dense. So you can't look at Hyde Park as a whole. It's a huge piece of land. You could put six um, pieces of land the size of the South End into Hyde Park. It, it's equivalent to having six South Ends. We don't talk about Hyde Park that way, but in fact, that is what is going on. So for instance, Crane Ledge, you go out eight blocks from the Crane Ledge Woods, that's the size of uh, the South End. And if you cut down those trees, if the developer cuts the trees down, you've immediately cut the tree uh, canopy of that neighborhood, the Crane Ledge neighborhood by 50%. I think we need to look at those details before making sweeping uh, statements about a neighborhood like Hyde Park, because it's huge. Um, but another point is on uh, this whole question, we, it's a tough nut to crack, is private land. The rights of, like I own, my wife and I own a single family house with a big backyard. We have, we have private land. But in fact, there's a lot of restrictions. I can't, for instance, open up an auto repair garage because it's a residential area. So, you know, why is that? Well, it's considered it'll do harm to my neighbors to have something like that. I'm restricted. And I think we should see our tree canopies, the destruction of our tree canopies as a, a, a harm to the greater neighborhood in the same way. Uh, that it isn't in our legislation now, but it should be. I, I think that is a way to, to view this problem. On uh, the specifics, I wish um, had just gone on before Mariana disappeared. I'd love to hear her answer. Um, we also have been talking about um, in our neighborhood tree planting on the sidewalks. The problem we have that problem she spoke about. It's a four four foot wide sidewalk. By with ADA, we can't put trees anywhere. We wonder, well, what if we bumped out the uh, the curb a little bit into, you know, parking place? And um, I, 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 we'd love to be a trial for that if that's actually uh, something that they're seriously considering. Um, I, it's, I can see it's going to be much more costly. They have to put in the curb and everything. Well, be, you know, just stuff to do. But I'd love to hear more about that. Um, Secondly, we have um, we have a micro park that went in about five years ago. Six saplings were planted. One of them died. I can't get it replaced. The 311 for tree planting is only for sidewalk trees. The parks department will not get around to this now until it's a renovation time, which is going to be another 15 years. That, that seems like a problem to me. And we can't get it fixed. We were told, well, go buy, you know, never go buy your own tree to plant it. Well, that's that's really not a good policy. I don't think that's not the way to do it. I'd like some answers to that. Um, these are the things that trip up this kind of progress. It comes down to these little details. Oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. And I'd like some I'd like some answers to that. And uh, 
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Lisa Beatman, and then we'll go to uh, Karen uh, Monty Brodick from the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. So, uh, Ms. Beatman, if you're ready. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Um, Councillors Arroyo and Braden and Lara for convening this and for uh, finally, finally uh, putting forth uh, an ordinance uh, draft to protect uh, one of the city's or some of the city's most precious irreplaceable uh, resources. Um, I'm also, um, I'm the other co-leader of the Mount Hope Canterbury Neighborhood Association, um, which really uh, encompasses several pocket neighborhoods uh, along American Legion. Um, and uh, so uh, a few things. I, I certainly support much of what has been said uh, regarding the language of the tree ordinance. Uh, we definitely want uh, and need to have uh, uh, the community at this table. Um, and um, let's see. Okay, mature tree canopy. Uh, I think I, I'd like to hear people use that term more. It's very important. Um, the, you know, there's measurable, enormous benefits of mature trees uh, that uh, all the planting of new saplings, the developers' promises of planting shrubbery and, and small ornamentals, uh, th those do not provide these benefits. Uh, so let's see a few things. Um, the language in the tree ordinance, I'm a, an old English teacher, so I focus, language is power, right? Um, we need, uh, let's see, we need stronger carrots and sticks to preserve the mature tree canopy. Um, I heard a lot of explanations, understandable explanations and some limitations, but we, we can and need to do better. There are other cities that do do better. Um, we cannot continue to allow um, uh, developers, uh, many of whom are, are you know, outside, uh, like they're out of, they're not local, they're not in the state, they're just extracting profits from Boston land. Um, and so uh, we, we have to have um, measures strong enough so that they don't consider destruction of trees and woodland as uh, the cost of doing business. The harms are too great. Um, let's see. So uh, we, we have to integrate uh, acknowledgement of and preservation of trees and other natural green infrastructure into the city's planning and zoning, as uh, another person mentioned before. Um, and that happens, has to happen now as the BPDA is undergoing uh, so many changes. Uh, the measurable public health benefits of the existing conditions of undeveloped land needs to be documented in the review process. Uh, the term vacant land should be stopped being used uh, to describe uh, undeveloped natural land with permeable soil and, uh, and trees and, and waterways. Um, any exemptions of uh, protection, preservation of those uh, resources uh, should be infrequent and rare. Developers must be required to submit photos and other evidence of existing conditions. And rendering should be required to be more accurate and not misleading. Uh, the, uh, I sent in a, a letter, or Rick and yep. I sent in a letter. Um, so uh, a couple things uh, from that. Let's see, let me move down. Um, yeah, so regarding back to the language of the, um, of the ordinance, 
Uh, the BPDA already requires an inventory of trees six caliper inches or more, acknowledging their value. The current pro proposed ordinance uh, starts at, uh, preserve, at looking to preserve uh, trees of eight inch calipers or more. Um, there's no reason to start higher than what the BPDA already requires. Um, there's a there's a big there's too much focus on on legacy heritage trees and and not enough focus on what I'm going to call working class trees, um, which especially when they are connected to connected tree pan canopy in the the diminishing remaining uh, woodlands that we have. Uh, there are many studies showing that the connected tree canopy, which is comprised of thick and thin trees, um, they, they need to be protected and they need to be measured. Canopy volume needs to be measured, not just tree diameter. Uh, and you. then public health, just public health, public health. That needs to be more in this equation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Karen, floor is yours. Unmute, I have to learn to unmute. Two master's degrees and I can't unmute. Um, thanks everyone. I really appreciate um, your time. Uh, thank you city councilors for bringing this very important uh, topic to uh, a broader conversation today. Um, my name is Karen Money Brodick. I'm the president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. I have the pleasure of working with many, many of you um, as we work to steward. Uh, Lisa, I, I really appreciate um, Lisa's comments about a connected tree canopy, which is um, the Emerald Necklace. And I wanted to um, just mention a couple of things. Um, I, I think it's so important that this, this, this panel and this conversation today really do think hard about what can be done to manage the loss on private land. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity on public land too, but what we saw in the urban forestry study was that most of the loss was on you know, land that it was outside full public control. Um, so I'm really excited to see how those things can happen because I think of all we can do on the Emerald Necklace and, and, and places that we have more control, but if things don't change on private land, we, um, we will still lose massive ground. Um, I wanted to mention that the Emerald Necklace Conservancy is continues to be every day thrilled that we are in a very close partnership with the city of Boston, the town of Brookline and DCR with um, a program called the Olmstead Tree Society. And we have uh, assigned uh, an active uh, memorandum of understanding where we match dollar for dollar using private donors uh, contributions, small and large to invest in uh, the tree canopy of the Emerald Necklace. And just this last year, we have now um, inventoried over 9,500 trees from Roxbury, Mattapan um, to the Back Bay, um, inspected, inventoried and pruned those. And I am excited, I'm excited that I think from what we heard at the hearing today, we may be um, in, in the future be able to say that about all the trees in Boston, because certainly the Emerald Necklace, though it comprises half of Boston's parkland, does not comprise all of the city's parks and does not comprise all of the city's uh, street trees. I, I think I will speak for the Emerald Necklace Conservancy and I say that I'd like to find ways that we could better connect um, and link and either through planting or other ways, the, the, the networks that um, were talked, by, talked about by the last um, species. Um, but again, I wanted to say, you know, thank you. We meet quarterly with the city of Boston's Parks Department to review the tree planting, the tree pruning, the tree work we're gonna be doing. I mean, it happens every quarter. I think it happens so well that you guys don't hear about it. You might not know what's going on, but um, every quarter we sit down and figure out what we're all doing to make sure that we are supporting in partnership um, these public trees uh, and the Emerald Necklace. And we've invested over $3 million um, of donations into the, er the Emerald Necklace. And I want this group to know that um, I've worked in two other cities and this is the only city that I have seen this type of a multi-jurisdictional public-private partnership that covers urban trees like this. Um, and I want to give credit to Boston for having this and for, um, you know, for for 
everyone entering into probably what was the first partnership of its kind uh, here in Boston. And I hope that it is something that we could use that might provide models uh, for other things. We do have a GIS inventory with all of those trees so we can um, track their care. And that is a really great tool. I appreciate um, some of the city councilors talking about that and trying to figure out how all the databases um, can talk to each other is, is important too. So thank you all. Um, I applaud uh, progress on this and I look forward to um, helping in any way that we can with the, through the um, staff or team of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy working with uh, counselors and others. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we have one more uh, who is on a phone number. So please identify yourself uh, by name and neighborhood when you start and then the floor is yours. So I don't have a name for you. I just have your phone number. Um, so floor is yours. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Craig Martin, Hyde Park. And I, um, I thank you for this opportunity, even though I wasn't uh, planning to speak. Um, but I, I heard so much today and so much good stuff. Um, but I am, I am troubled by the bifurc bifurcation of this. It seems like, and this just seems backwards, why we're today spending time, when time is in essence, as an earlier caller mentioned, we are losing trees right now. Why we're spending time on the government sector when it was already explained that we already do have safety protections um, on the government sector. Why today we're not starting with the private lands? We should be getting that done right away. Um, I, <clears throat> I do want to um, bring to everyone's attention um, that High Park, I didn't like the way it was just said, kind of like low priority. Um, let's focus on these high priority areas. Look at Hyde Park has some trees. Um, I, want, I want everyone to know that our state is benefiting from the trees in Vermont, even down the Amazon um, currently. So all trees preserved, including those in Hyde Park, and I'm specifically referring to the Crane, Crane's Ledge, where we have acres of forest. That should be a priority. All of Boston is benefiting from the existence of those trees, emitting the oxygens and absorbing carbons. Um, it just doesn't, they just don't emit oxygen to a, a border line, no. Um, so we all benefit, and I'm hoping that we can save those acres while in the process of looking for hard to find um, spaces down in Chinatown and downtown. Um, that's gonna be a long time. We've got chances right now to save existing mature canopies. And I'm hoping that the, um, um, the council considers that. Um, let's get what's available now. Meanwhile, let's work on the harder to find parcels um, at the same time um, and that, are in, that are in priority areas. I thank you for um, giving me that time today. Thank you for calling in. Thanks for, your, thanks for your focus. Thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, we are going to adjourn. We have another hearing in a very quick turnaround time. Uh, so thank you to uh, the city administration officials here. Thank you to the counselors who have come through uh, and to our central staff. Thank you for managing the the quick time here. What I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll gavel that one in at 2.20 if you can make sure folks can just start to come in and pull in at 2.15. Thank you, uh, Mr. Woods uh, and everyone else from the city. Good to, good to meet you, Todd.